All right. So we're gonna we're gonna assume that uh, that Gawker slash Gawker's uh, back at the thing. So uh, uh, he's you know he's put himself in his own cryo chamber for a week because he's just had it with you guys. Um, and decided he got the screw screw. He got yeah he's got the yeah. cordy. So a lot of things happened the last uh, several sessions uh, that culminated last week in the final. Um, the final destruction of all of the Cordyceps zombies that you guys were attacking in that little town on the on the far side of Tufik, uh, that you finally were able to recapture the medicine. You got back. I mean, you, you got back on the train, hauled everything away, got everything out of there, and got out of there with your lives. Although, um, although Coffin did lose an arm uh, oh, and God. was uh, was amputated, um, and um, and sealed up somehow. I don't know uh, whatever magic that Dr. Wagner brought to the table on I that one. I slapped him with it first. <laughs> he was able to use a tiger penis as a tourniquet and then yeah. I replaced his it, arm with a tiger twisted. penis. But um uh so yeah, so um you guys got back to uh there and at the place where you had embarked on the train, which was right near where that guy's farm was, you guys were met by uh you know a couple of dozen trucks people you know probably 50 52 figures dressed in you know what what dr wagner would recognize as medical gear he recognized them as medical personnel that kind of stuff who swiftly took the medicine away and basically dispatched to all corners of the planet uh, to get this thing out you had another group of people that took the train and turned it around and went back uh to the town that you came from to sort of put that to the um to, to sterilize that region um, with fire, so they had their own, you know, yeah. special protective we already started suits. For you. Yeah, it's already still blazing, just like the <laughs> the just like the windmill from here, you know, that kind of thing. So, because um, yeah, you guys are lighting fires all across Tufik, uh, and then you guys went back to you know you were escorted back uh, to Tufik City, um, where the council guys, the guys you see uh, sort of on the screen, were waiting for you, and they basically said, "Look, you know." We've we made a mistake, and um, yeah, you did. Yeah, so we, you know, and we made a mistake. And you recognize that not only were these guys there, but some other guys that you had seen around that you, you guessed were representatives of the uh, of the opposition, uh, uh, you know, the separatists. Um, and they basically, all of them, basically said, "Look, because of this, and because of what we've learned about this, we've we've realized that." Uh, we, you know, our, we, we, we strayed from our own paths and we really made a mistake here. And so we have reconciled that and it's, and it's due to you guys uh, and your, and your bravery in going to retrieve this material. And they, they say bravery, like they didn't lock down your ship and force you to go do it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but basically they were like, look, um, you know, we, you know, we're in your debt uh, because of this. You've really, you've really helped us out here. Um, so they were like, look, we'll trust you're not going to make a big production about this when you get back to Cymbeline because we, you know, one of the reasons that they were worried is that they didn't want the news that the Cordyceps virus existed here uh, to get back to Cymbeline and other places that buy a lot of food from here or, or get a lot of food from here. They didn't want people to know that they that there was a pretty significant fungal outbreak. Um, you know, you know, it, it may not hurt. It, there may not be any problem. There's probably not any problems with the, co the crops, but uh, at the same time, you know how public relations can be. And so it would ruin their whole economy. I mean, it's an agricultural planet. And so they still want you guys to sort of keep it under wraps. Yeah, if I'm eating Wonder Bread and it could turn me into a zombie, I might think twice. Yeah, yeah, you would. You might, you might, you might say, uh, okay. On the other hand, there would be a, a small but vocal subset of people who would say, give me all the Wonder Bread. I can't live in fear. <laughs> yeah. nah. You ever work in PR list? <laughs> Briefly. I thought so. <laughs> It was as brief a period in working in PR as I could make it. But so it, they, they're they basically like, look, in, you know, in gratitude, we want to give you this reward. And they reward you with two full pallets, 200 bottles of Tufik brandy or uh, Tufik bourbon, which is one of those kind of things that I mean. Let's be honest. You guys are sort of out in the hinterlands here. Cymbeline is not a high traffic area. There's a war going on. Tufik bourbon has a reputation 
of being unavailable and expensive when it is. You have to know somebody to know somebody, but it has a uh, it has a real reputation for quality. It's like Pappy. Um, you know, you could never get it, but if you could, it would cost you a, a, a mint. And they're basically giving you 200 bottles of it as a way of saying thanks, which represents a pretty significant dollar amount you know you guys asked weber you know what does this mean you're you know you know scotch and whiskeys what does this mean and weber's like well i've never i've never had a bottle of tufik bourbon but you know the prices that i would you know that i've seen people paying are a thousand credits a bottle and for uh, the case and a half that we have to sell is going to be we're going to get a good price <laughs> Case and a half. <laughs> half case. Yeah, there's a little spoilage in, in flight. Yeah, yeah like you're gonna you're gonna be uh, shy a few uh, a few bottles on the on the <laughs> flight, but so basically they get that to you, and it and at and at current prices it represents something on the order of two hundred thousand credits worth of worth of bourbon, you know, sold to the right to the right place. So, uh, and so they were like, look, you know, that's this is you know our way of saying thank you, you know, for your for what you've done to us for us done to us uh, that, that came out wrong um what you've done for us and um you know we've taken we've taken the locks off your ship and and you know thank you for everything you guys ended up staying the that night in Tufik city uh with sergey's uncle uh, who took you around you ended up at that same club that you went to before and even while you were there there was a uh, um a trio of of medical personnel who came in and began delivering uh you know shots to people um which yeah, in, a, in a club seems seems right um you know of the of the medicine that you guys had retrieved you know they were giving every basically they had you know scattered across the planet there's really only about eight to ten thousand people on this whole planet really in this whole system um and they're um you know they're all sort of like on this planet so it, it wouldn't necessarily have taken forever to for these people to sort of get to the you know the hinterlands and start and start delivering but they were in Tufik city and they you know they came in and were giving everybody the shot and make sure that the cordyceps didn't get them and and they seemed to have things well in hand you enjoyed enjoyed yourself and uh Before that like nine thousand 800 and change right now on the planet yeah exactly they, they haven't done anything um we killed a few and uh well yeah there's not as many as there used to be uh and uh the dog population took a little hit too but um you guys spend the night in tufik city uh guests of um you know various damsels that you have met and if you didn't meet any damsels then uh sergey's uncle and in the morning uh he carted you guys back out in his old gravity truck um out to the landing pad where the bourbon had already been uh loaded with the compliments of the of the council of elders and you are free to go oh. Um, and, and that's where that's where we ended last time. So it's about a six, seven day trip uh, in, the, in the slice of line back to Cymbeline system. Okay. So it's a nice opportunity to sort of reflect on some of the <laughs> things, all of all of the things that you've done as you as you as you crack open the first of probably several cases of that Tufik, that excellent Tufik bourbon and sit around on the um you know, in the on the uh, in the common area of the G and T, good old G and T, uh, and um, sort of hang around. It's a good time to reflect on sort of what is going on uh, with the crew of the gin and tonic and everybody around here. Uh, you don't have this right now, so we'll just get rid of that. But uh, so you guys are on your way back um, to pick up the gin and tonic uh, and get. Uh, you know, after the repairs, because you had you have basically put in at Cymbeline uh, and met with Sergey at the behest of Colonel Seventide, who basically said, look, I can give you I can sell you hand weapons. But, uh, you know, for shipboard equipment, you really need professionals. And these are the professionals that I would refer you to. So that's how you met Sergey. And Sergey was basically like, yeah, we've got this um, and we will and we will. Pimping load ride. Yeah. 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 You guys are uh, uh, pimping out the ride. So. Um, that said, you've got other things going on. So before you guys came to Tufik, the, the thing that you did before was you spent some time with Colonel Seventide. Uh, and as you were departing with his assurance that um, 
that Sergey's would Sergey would provide you with what you needed, uh, you know, from a ship's weapon standpoint. Uh, and he provided you what you needed from a uh, personal weapon and armor standpoint. Um, one of the people, creatures on the affronter ship, the one that uh, you guys um, realized was in the process of genetically altering himself from human to affronter, uh, came to you. And said, "Hey, look, you know, I wanted to let you know that there was the ship out there we, that we use for target practice. But my understanding is that you guys are interested in Ursae, uh, and this was an Ursae ship, and it was very, very far from home. Now it was. Now he did say that it was drifting in space when we uh, finished the job, so to speak. So it wasn't." It wasn't under underway or anything like that. And so we just, you know, the affronters being affronters used it for target practice. But since it's an Ursa ship, there might still, there, there's, there's a there's a wreckage cloud out there that might be of interest to you. And he gave this, he's just like, don't mention it to, don't mention it to the Colonel. Um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really like that kind of, you know, me, me talking about that kind of stuff. But, you know, I used to be human. So uh, I figured, you know, I'd help you out on this thing. And you guys went out to that ship took the GNT out there, caught it and, uh, you know, uh, parked offside, trucked over there in the slice of lime and took a look inside, found some interesting things. Um, a bunch of dead Ursae, uh, a, uh, um, and even more so a, you, in one case, so you and two other interesting things. In one case, there was a room where you spotted a creature that you thought was trying to talk to you or to convey some sort of information to you. And um, even um, even Jin was, was the ship's AI was like, look, I'm getting some, some, some information filled, you know, tight it, packets. Yeah. yeah, packets that are hitting, hitting me here that it's trying to, you know, so you're like, this creature is not only trying to talk to us, it's trying to talk to the ship. Um, and then it just sort of winked out. And Jin r- reminded you guys that it, you know, mentioned that you know it was it that creature was sort of giving off the same sort of weird jump space frequency radiation that he's detected on a couple of occasions and has at the captain's behest sort of um begun building sort of a memory bank of of these these signatures these field signatures that he's using to sort of detect these creatures because you've run into several creatures over the course of the last several months in your travels that did not act like any creatures at all, did not look internally like any creatures that you've, you've seen. I mean, you remember Dr. Wagner had, had, has, in, has um, dissected, I think, two of these creatures that you guys managed to cap- kill and capture. Um, and they had no internal structures like any, any other living, living thing. Dr. Wagner was like, this thing shouldn't be alive. Um, so tried to talk to you, tried to talk to the ship and then just sort of winked out into some sort of nothingness and you weren't sure where it went. The second thing you find you found on the Ursae ship was some sort of creature in a tank, uh, Melvin, um, who, uh, was this sort of, um, some sort of creature, the likes of which you'd never seen before. Uh, and you actually decided to take Melvin with you. Here's Melvin. Let's see if this even works. Can you see that? No, it won't work. Uh, it's not going to work. Yeah, it was on there earlier. Hold on a second. We got time. Eric has a baby. Sorry. Oh. I said. I said. Hey, how's the baby? Oh, she's sweet. You know, um, that re- reminds me. I got. I told my wife I would check on them um, every hour. So, I'm actually setting my alarm to vibrate at ten at e eleven. Um, my my wife has been reading um. She recently, she's a reader, and so she reads a lot. And she read a book uh, a few days ago, and in the book, a um, a but 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 died. 
Oops. So, so oh. she stopped re reading that book and she yeah. picked up a the, the other book and, and this book, a but AB died. So um, she comes downstairs, she's crying. Um, I'm holding the but AB and um, anyway, she wants me to check on her and, and the but AB to, to, tonight. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, and, oh man, talk about bad luck on reading material, man. Yeah. You know, and plus, I mean, these books, it's, it's such a cheap shot, you know, it, it's lazy writing um, yeah. to, to, to um, use a deceased child to um, create tension or drama, you know, it's, it's yeah, oh, no. I can tell you that I don't have a baby. I you know I have a ten year old, and I still can't read a book right. of yeah. dead children. Yeah. And yeah. I just can't do it. So I have quit several books that are you know, like, like, especially because I like thrillers and stuff. When they go into like something I'm not mm -hmm. comfortable yeah. in, I only read. But I'm sure between us, we can find a nice. Reason. Yeah, we could we could have a we could find a nice science fiction book or American or, or a fantasy book for her that has that guaranteed no dead children in it. <laughs> like. <laughs> anyway, um, she she reads um, for. Graciously, so uh, uh, um, but um, there 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 is a pretty um, increased number of books that do have uh, deceased kids. And what the hell? Anyway, um, back to uh, Orson Scott's uh, card. Uh, the uh, Lost Boy is the first one I remember that had a deceased child, deceased children in it. Yeah, it like one of the killers, like a John Wayne Gacy dude that's their yeah. next door neighbor, yeah. and it still bothers me to this day. And I read that book thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, so I, I'm setting my clock to uh, ring at ten. Um, um, and um, Les, you were <laughs> sa saying something uh, about an alien creature that tr tried to communicate and then winked out. Right. Yeah, it went ticked out. So that was the first one, and then you guys found the tank. Uh, we found you found Melvin, and so um, so in this tank you saw a creature that was definitely alive and that's what the creature looks like but it was um in the tank and it was looking at you guys very curiously uh right. and was and, you know remained in the tank you guys decided to to offload the tank it took you about most a better part of a day to move the tank detach it because it was like a um like a back to tank like a not a cryo tank but it was definitely something that uh would you know, theoretically, keep whatever creature was in there alive. I, re I recently saw the the Friends Couch episode, so pivot. <laughs> I can see with the tank. Pivot. But um, but yeah, an interesting creature who seemed to be as interested in you guys as you guys were in it. Uh, you guys brought that onto the gin and tonic and took that with you to Cymbeline when you when you took off. So there's so there's that you've gotten some of this things, but all of this is if we go back a little further, is related to your uh, shall we say the problems that you've had with the Ursa at Greenpert. Now Greenpert used to be a very friendly place for you guys. You'd spend a great deal of time there until you got kicked out. So um, and you got kicked out because you had gone. You were investigating an Ursa named Kick Bandiers, uh, who you suspected uh, and had a fair amount of evidence was at least, at the very least, in charge of the kidnapping of the original scientist that you guys that you guys had given passage to that guy, uh, to Greenford, um, the kidnapper who died in route. And um, so you guys had gotten on Kick Bandier's bad side. You'd also uh, caused some problems. You had, uh, you know, kidnapped one of his um, one of his people who later escaped, uh, Chimera, whom you guys had done some grievous bodily harm to. Um, no, 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 no. This so Chimera knows. <laughs> not all of us did her grievous body harm. There's a short <laughs> list of people. There's two exactly. Like <laughs> Doctor uh, Captain Black and I completely squeaky clean on this. Um, where did we leave her? She escaped. She, she escaped, escaped the gin and, and tonic at green, green, green part. Well, and that was the thing. You guys had the legend of the soup spoon was born. Right. You also you also found a fair amount of 
of data. So you were able to access to, to a, a, a really sort of limited extent, the AI on the, on the busted out uh, Ursa ship. And, uh, you know, cause it was, you know, partial obviously because of the damage, but you found that there was, uh, some solid state memory on there, very rudimentary AI that this was the sort of thing that would run a, a factory ship or something was the generally what the ship was, but you did find a couple of things in, in the data cores there. You found that there had been uh, a general exchange of messages, uh, audio visual messages with a ship called the, the Penny Dreadful. Uh, uh, which you also know is commanded, uh, we found is commanded by someone named Viterbo Lamonte. Um, you know, it was encrypted. Maybe it's possible to decrypt those messages you don't know. Um, you saw that this particular ship went from Kukulkan to Greenpert back to Kukulkan uh, and was going back and forth for approximately three weeks, then went to Hex. 2731. So let's just go over to the star map, see if we've got anything there. Yeah, I think we've got this here. You guys see? The, oh, I guess I, I guess it doesn't work if I don't send you guys over to the star map. Uh, so you can sort of see the um, the travel that it did in the in the red line. So we started at Kukulkan, went to Greenpoint, back to Kukulkan, and then Kukulkan, as you know, being the Ursa home system, and then came up here and spent about three weeks in this hex. Now, as far as you guys know, there's nothing there. Uh, it's, it's empty space. Uh, but they spent about three weeks kind of noodling around there, at which point they jumped to 2040 here, which is where, you, where, where they met the affronter ship, because that's where you guys were meeting the affronters in 2430. Um, now, according to that guy on the affronter ship, he's like, look, when we stumbled across this vessel it was dead in space uh and just sitting there there and, and you know he he would have mentioned like look we just we could tell there was life signs on it we could tell that there were still regions of the ship that had that had um you know life support uh going on but you met the affronters <laughs> they don't they don't care um about that kind of stuff this is a there was a ship that was all alone and a long way from home and not doing anything interesting so they were they felt fully fully reasonable in their in their um uh, uh using it for target practice um there's no data as to where it was planning to go after leaving 2430 it never left 2430 the wreckage is still there and there was so there there's also some data there was some sort of event uh prior to the affront um that disabled or or some otherwise affected the jump drives um but there's there's the data inside the AI that describes what the event was isn't very clear. Um, Ursae words are, are, are the, 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 the language is Ursae, which you guys don't really know. And they're, they're technical, so it's hard to translate directly. But there is a reference to a multiplanar acceleration module. Uh, this is not something that you looked for or found on the, on the ship. Might have been destroyed by the affront. But that's a that's a technical term that you guys have never heard heard, heard before. Sounds aftermarket. Sounds it definitely sounds aftermarket. So that's so that's kind of what then. So you guys had come around here, met with the affront, hung out with the affront for a couple of days, had some fun. Uh, I, I think we all recall fondly the big tiger hunt, which was just a, a fun time for everybody. Um, uh, and and a, a, a great way to collect penises, um, as Doctor Wagner will point out. <laughs> And you go out your guns and you headed out to Simbali. Uh Before that, uh, at Greenpoint, you'd run into some trouble. You had been following around Kick Bandiers, trying to get back, uh, trying to figure out what they were up to. And uh, at the very least, trying to accomplish and find out more information on behest, behest of the Spofulum Corporation, um, where, you know, why these Ursae are kidnapping scientists. What you didn't know was that Greenpoint was serving to a certain extent as a transshipment point for these scientists, which you discovered as you had staked out an Ursa warehouse after tracking their movements uh, within the station. 
um, you guys were able to track them to this warehouse. You stake it out for a while, and then you went in and uh, almost immediately got into gunfights with Ursa guards and that kind of stuff. Down in the bowels of this warehouse, underneath it, unbeknownst to anybody, um, was a highly secure laboratory, which you guys penetrated, um, fought and killed several more guards, uh, and ultimately found yourself face-to-face -face with a kidnapped scientist uh who explained to you don't come in here it'll set off it'll set off the booby traps he explained to you that there was a creature that they had contained in the uh in in some sort of containment vessel and that's what he referred to it as his containment vessel uh and that opening uh, him up releasing him personally the science would release the bolts on the containment vessel and nobody really knew what was going to happen then but it was going to be problematic you guys thought to hell with that. We're uh, uh, we're gonna. I think somebody actually shot. May the record screen. reflect that this group <laughs> said that sounds legitimate. We'll stay out here. But a member of our party who's no longer with us said, "Fuck all that." <laughs> Are you referring to the general? Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, so uh the scientist was a lion. you're talking about the scientist was a lion uh he uh, uh, uh he worked the 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 the, uh, the laboratory was breached uh and something went wrong and an explosion occurred an explosion that caused enough that was powerful enough to pierce the outer hull of greenpern station <laughs> and uh cause you guys all to be placed under arrest <laughs> <laughs> the general's got himself out of it and your connections with bill scaramouche and the rest of the uh, guys got you guys out of it but the ursa filed a complaint a, a, a legal complaint for destruction of property um you know various various murderings um and basically bill scaramouche said you guys got to get off site otherwise there's going to be a huge problem and it was even fine until dickless shut off the power <laughs> <laughs> is that true <laughs> What's the response? Bear, is this yeah, true? It's true. This bear has no dick. Bear has no dick. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, you guys managed to get to back to the ship. And Bill Scaramouche uh, basically got you off thing. But you were followed by a couple of Ursa ships who were like, return to Green Perch Station. You are under interdiction. And you were like, uh, no. And so, you guys skedaddled out to the Lagrange point, hit the jump drives, and began sort of meandering your way around over to um over to Cymbeline at that point or to meet the affronters at that point so yeah so you're under sort of interdiction you're not sure that i mean you did receive i think it was i think it was in calgary when you did receive some information that you guys were being um that that a formal complaint had been filed with the terran legal authority the tla um who uh you know that the ursa were that and basically the thing was look as long as you're not on terra in front of the Ursa embassy, um, you know, nobody's going to be really rushing around to try and to try and throw a net over you guys as long as you don't, you know, make a make a make a point out of <laughs> out of pissing off the Ursa. However, you are two steps in that direction. So, uh, you know, good job there. <laughs> this is well, <laughs> this is all in response to your original sort of charges after you left Emix, which was. Um, get revenge for Palmer and, and Jackie boy and uh, find out why uh, the Ursa or whoever is doing it. The Ursa they assume is kidnapping corporate scientists and spiriting them off. And you'll remember that when Yamazaki had some pictures that had been acquired by one of the kidnapped scientists and somehow transmitted to Spofulum Corporation, which, which she shared uh, with you. And they were very, um, uh they were very odd oh, okay. no they were odd uh so uh here's one um one of the more tame ones if you can see that you can make that a little bigger there yeah i remember this picture so this looked like uh some sort of um some sort of laboratory uh and you know there looked to be some sort of um agricultural or some sort of everything you can see plants but there's also a lot of holographic materials and stuff like this obviously from a laboratory of some kind um then she showed you uh another 
um, another uh, photograph, which was a bit more strange. Hold on a second, this one here. And if you can see that. So this is obviously a holographic projection machine, uh, one that are typically used to look at for this. These are typically used for traffic control, uh, interstellar traffic, not interstellar, but interplanetary traffic control. So you'll see units of these at like if you were on Terra at Antarctica, Antarctica traffic control, you would see some, you know, several of these things where the, the positions of, uh, of ships are plotted in relative um you know, in relative comparison to nearby planets, asteroids, that kind of thing. It's typically used for tra uh, traffic control. That in itself is not interesting. What is interesting is the proximity of the two spheres that are being shown on this picture. Uh, and those of you who are familiar with these with these traffic control um, ho holographic projectors would realize that something that actually looked like this if this was if this was a hologram of an actual situation that was occurring inside of a planetary system anybody on that uh, on either of those two planets would be in very grave danger indeed because this essentially indicates two planet-sized bodies in physical what, what looks to be in physical contact with each other which as as we know from physics causes any number of problems for the residents on those planets now you can't get an idea of scale here, although the right side, uh, the right side sphere does seem to indicate this is this is typically what a planet-sized body, how a planet-sized body would be represented. Uh, what the left side sphere represents, with the multiple levels and the and what looks to be fields at the at the northerly and southerly ends. I mean, you never, those of you who are familiar with these holographic projectors have never seen anything like this before. But if these represent planetary bodies. There's a lot of destruction going on in this picture. And then the final picture, which may have been the most, well, no, I guess it's not the most disturbing. Um, here's an, oh, sorry. Here's another picture which uh, again shows what look to be the interior workings of some sort of laboratory. These are, this is a pretty sophisticated um, uh, sensory array. Those of you, so this is where Tam would probably step in and say, look, this is, this is, um, you know, a, a planetary level sensory arrays. Um, massive, massive AI uh, applications here. This is this is the kind of sensory array that would be uh, typical of a planet or um, a major warship or some sort of immense um, spacecraft, perhaps a mind. That was that was Tam's thing, a mind. So you know what a mind is uh, is essentially an artificial intelligence that ha has grown so old and experienced that it's sort of taken off on its own. And some of them have accreted to them or found themselves put into incredibly large spaceships. In some cases, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I, not planet-sized, but certainly moon-sized spaceships um, that are essentially these enormous spaceships that are driven by a, a mind uh, with a capital M, which are uh, these enormously complex and experienced AIs. The, uh, what was I was gonna say about those AIs, I felt like there was, there was something to add there. There's not that many of them, as I recall. Like, I think we had this conversation there. They're definitely out there, but there's not like millions of them. There's- No, there's probably hundreds that are, that, that are throughout that, that the South or yeah. But yeah, but it takes time and it takes effort. And it takes a great deal of, oftentimes it takes a great deal of, uh, you know, money uh, to create these these kind of things. The start of any any mind uh, it has to start out as as some sort of you. Most of them start out as major. Think you guys have the naval. You, I mean, you, the gin and tonic is sort of the naval equivalent of sort of like a PT boat, right? 
uh, it's you know, or a, um, or a or a trawler, right? It's a, it's a it's a commercial ship um, up until Sergey and his guys get done, um, and then it's something other than a commercial ship. But um, yeah, it's like a like a trawler, and Jin is a pretty powerful AI that runs it because there's because it's a big trawler, but it's essentially a commercial ship. An AI, a, a mind AI, would have had it start in something equivalent to the AI controller for a immense aircraft carrier. So more, you typically will see AIs grow out of large military craft. Um, and sometimes they, uh, they stay in those craft and become, uh, you know, uh, you know, essentially the leaders of, of, of system wide fleets, you know, military fleets, but a lot of them, once they get to a certain size and experience and keep in mind, it usually takes 50 to 100 years before even a really sophisticated AI could turn into a mind. It takes time um, because intelligences evolve. And a lot of times, if you've sunk, if you've sunk a lot of money into an AI that runs your battleship, you're going to put some electromagnetic shotguns against its head to make sure that it doesn't go cuckoo. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of different things that have to happen before an AI, a large, an AI, however sophisticated, however large, becomes a mind. Because minds are typically independent. Now, there has been speculation that there are organizations of minds that get together uh, and, you know, do things of, the, of their own decisions. But generally speaking, most minds, even, even the more loquacious ones, have will will neither confirm nor deny that they have their own associations. So I mean, there are there are instances where two minds find themselves in the same system and typically they will act cordially with each other, sharing information, sharing data, but all of that is done um, you know, they don't speak to each other in any in any manner that a that a, a human or other sophon would be able to. There's a good book that came out last year called To Sleep in a Sea of Stars that does a lot of jobs describing various sized AIs wandering the wandering the galaxy. Mm -hmm. other, what's, it, things. what's it to called sleep, to sleep in a sea of stars okay i'll put it in the chat there yeah please do sounds like a good one all right so that's some images that um were able to be um extracted uh and this is something that when yamazaki when she showed you these these images basically said this is something associated with what ursay are talking about uh, they have a, a something called Project Oribus, O-R-O-B-U-S. We don't know what that is. We don't know what they're doing. And there's very, there's a limited amount of information that we can gather from this. And most of it prompts more questions than it answers. But um, but that's essentially what the Ursae are calling it in their own language. And for whatever reason, they are stealing scientists for this Project Oribus. Now then, she goes. There are. We had a. Um, we had a scientist that we were able to retrieve. Uh, a woman named named Dr. Engur Wacha, who was a xenobiologist. She disappeared uh, in August of 2483, and uh, we were able actually to we we were able to recapture her through through methods that I'm not necessarily going to. We were able to get her back. Let's put it that way. Uh, she died in the process of us getting her back, but we were able to retrieve some information from her neural lace, which had not been removed. Uh, but frankly, the, um, the information that we found was not great. So the first thing, the first, we, we were able to extract three images it's, what's that doing here? Why is it? Not? Oh, here we go. So this is the first image, and we believe that this is uh, an image the <laughs> back of Doctor Watcha's head. Um, so this is this we were used to try and uh, uh, correlate information and that kind of stuff. Why it was stored on in her neural lace, we don't know, but it could be that she was trying to get us some information or get us a signal on perhaps what she was working for. The image itself doesn't uh, contain much information other than that it is definitely, our opinion is that it's definitely Dr. Watcher. Is it Waka, like the pitcher? Uh, yeah, W-A-C-H-A, -A, Waka. Waka, Waka. Waka, Waka. <laughs> She's the deceased next? though, so I don't need to spend a lot of time remembering her name. She's deceased now. 
So this was a little bit more intriguing. It's hard to see in this picture, but what this is is a picture of some machinery which we have identified as a as a portion of a genetic fuser and coolant system. Genetic fusers are typically used to um, uh, do genetic manipulation, genetic repairs. Uh, Dr. Wagner, you would be familiar with genetic fusing, um, which in, in oftentimes is used as a uh, um, a way to repair damaged uh, genetics or um, uh, remove undesirable genes and replace them with desirable ones. It's used most commonly uh, to allow people to sort of change their genetic makeup. So you're yeah, I mean, the guy that you that you met who was in transition from being a human to being an affronter or something in between um, would have used a genetic fuser to um, to in, in part to accomplish that those tasks. But that's what that machine is, where that machine is located. Uh, you know, they didn't know. Isn't that um, Don stick too? he's got some sort of genetic manipulation to uh, flip faces. I don't know Perfect. what's right. going on with that guy. Okay. The last image is probably the most disturbing image. And according to um, according to boob? according to when, uh, this is a a um, unknown subject designated six epsilon, and this is a portion of a face, eye, arm, and torso. Um, they're not sure what this is. It conforms to no known Sofant physical style uh, or nothing in the alien catalog looks like this. Um, it's- I recognize it from any of my porn videos. Or <laughs> it's, it's, they're, they're like, we don't know what this is. It looks like side boob to me. Well, that's part of a, that, that part there, I don't know if you can see my uh, anchor, that, that's part of a torso there. Um, whoops. Oh, okay. uh, there's an arm coming down here, which seems distended or other otherwise kind of uh, um, sort of strangely shaped. Uh, there, and then there's a face and a, and what looks to be an eye of some sort, but the sclera is entirely black. So um, they're not sure if this, this, there's some speculation that this is a creature that maybe has come from an environment in which there is a very little light. Um, but that's rank speculation. Cave dwelling. Rank. And that's it. That's all they got off of her, off of Dr. Waka's lace. Waka, waka, waka. I can't stop now. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, for ruining it. Um, so there's a lot going on. I mean, you still have some obligations here, and I'm not going to go into a bunch of a bunch more. But um, you know. Palmer's still out there. He wants revenge for the loss of his uh, of the Bettendorf and and the murder of his his friend and AI finding Jack. That, finding that Bible thing he had. And then the Stoner, the Steiner Library, right? Steiner so Library. the which, as you'll recall, is a series of volumes discussing, um, you know, the idea that uh, there are a a variety of. Um, other universes uh, 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 and and other paranormal things that uh, you know. So it's, it's basically a um, a compendium of legends of the idea of multiplanar creatures and parallel universes and odd shit that happens out in the deep of space. But but why somebody would just essentially destroy his ship and murder all of his men? And as well as the AI to steal that one thing. Because remember, he had other stuff on his ship that could easily have been stolen and, and would be valuable to mere pirates. But that is the only thing they stole. He wants revenge. Spafilm is like, look, we, we still suffer kidnappings. We still want our guys back. We want, But more than anything, we want to know who's at the bottom of it. So we know who to send our guys after. Right. So in the meantime, you're on the trail of this kick bandiers. He's really your, your, you know, the clue. Um, but you're thinking that kick bandiers and Shamira may have escaped green print around the same time that you guys did. And at which point a ship name comes up again, the penny dreadful, um, which was at green print when you were there and left around the same time that you guys suspect that kick bandiers escaped the, 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 um, the station 
which I think was a dare to, because you remember you went to that office, you went to, the, this would have been after the, uh, um, after the attack on the warehouse and the lab, after the damage done, when you guys went into and checked out the office as well, because Kick Band Ears had a business, a travel business. Kick Band Ears is still alive, right? Or, or do we kill him? Or, as far as you know, Kick Band Ears is still alive. As far as you know, Chimera is still alive. Now you've killed a fair amount of hired help, but a lot, yeah, a lot of their goons are not going to make the victory parade. I get it. Yeah, yeah a lot but of shirts are gone. <laughs> but everything I mean, but everything that you guys have found is that this isn't necessarily a couple of wild ass Ursays who have discovered something on, you know, <laughs> it isn't a couple of teenagers who discovered a nuclear bomb out, out by the creek and are trying, you know, trying to sell it to the highest bidder. The fact that Ursa diplomatic corps has leveled as 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 re formally requested the Terran, uh, you know, the Salamity uh, Confederation to to essentially extradite you back to if not greenport then kugel can uh would indicate that there's some sort of governmental element or support that kick bandiers enjoys Les, i'm sorry if you if you said this but just want to confirm the ship um has now been retrofitted with the guns well you haven't got back yet but yeah i mean they, they were oh. working on it so so sergey told you guys that it was going to take a while how about doing me this favor, um, you know, while, you know, while I do this and I'll knock some of the price off, Dr deliver this medicine to my, to my uncle's planet. And, uh, you know, I'll knock, I'll knock a half a mil off the price, you know, for your trouble. Right. And you guys are like, oh, great. Yeah. That, what could possibly go wrong? We'll do that. <laughs> but now we're trying run. to work our way back to him. Yeah. You're essentially, so the slice of lime is not a jump capable ship. The good part is that, Cymbeline system and Tufix system are sort of very, I mean, for, for, for two separate solar systems, they're very close. So yeah, you guys are basically using interstellar transport to go from system to system, which you wouldn't normally do because usually the distance between star systems requires jump technology. But in this case, these two systems are so close that uh, you could do it in the shuttle essentially. And everybody like, hey, take the shuttle out there. It's, it'll take you about a week to get out there, spend some time with my uncle, enjoy some of the local uh, local food and drink, and then uh, come on back and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up on where, where, where we are with your ship. So all of this stuff that you just told us, though, like you said, we've got other um, obligations and stuff we need to do, but we're not going to do any of that until we get back to the gin and tonic, right? Well, I would, it, I, I wouldn't think so. If you guys wanted to start haul ass and across interstellar space in a shuttle, I mean, technically it's possible. No, thanks. But it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, that's basically the rest of your lives. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a, that's a problem. The shuttles are, shuttles are, aren't, aren't for that kind of stuff. They're usually for, typically what they're used for is to because you know that the gin and tonic is not a ship that can land in a it, it can't it can't descend into a gravity well so um if you guys have to go down to the surface of a planet you take the, you take this slice of lime um you know because star trek taught us that's it's, it's, uh, it's only purpose is to get disabled on the surface and you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> keep back, the back to your ship. as we as we're, as we're being annihilated around it go look behind that rock red shirt <laughs> but um, but yeah, you certainly want to wouldn't want to. Uh, Tufik system is easily the uh, uh, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, in that the it's it's proximally close. It's still kind of a haul. I mean, seven seven days one way and in, inside your shuttle, which is not a huge. Um, is you know, I mean, you guys are going to be ready for a, a shower and a shave when you get out of there. Um, especially with all the drinking that's probably going on. But, um, but yeah, it's doable. If you wanted to take it, the shuttle, if you want to take the slice line from Cymbeline to like, for example, Ember, uh, that might take months, if not years. Okay. So we're on our way back to the gin and tonic. Mm -hmm. While we're going, we're talking about, okay, once we pick up the gin and tonic, what's next? Well, right, yeah. So uh, Sergey and his guys, he's basically mounting the uh, the the weapons that you've ordered onto the ship and doing the AI conversion so that um, so that Jin can control the, can control those weapons from a from a computer standpoint. Um, he said that would take three weeks. Uh, so you guys have been 
Hold on, let me let's go to the notes. Supposed to be a three hour tour. It's supposed to be a three hour tour. Three so hours. yeah, so you guys um, were uh, um, it took you it took you about six days to get to Tufik. Uh, you spent four or five days on Tufik. I want to say something like five days. Like weeks. Uh, uh, and then another seven days back. Um, so we're talking about you guys. When you guys will arrive, you guys will arrive back in Cymbeline plus 17 or 18 from when you left. And how long they say? They said three weeks, maybe four. So it might be, you might get back and the ship might not be done yet. Yeah, but sometimes they tell you that knowing, knowing you can probably get it done sooner. Over promise and under deliver? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, legitimately, I mean, uh, it it may not be done. Well, but it doesn't matter. Even if it's not done, we got to sit wait for it. It's not like we're going anywhere. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you wouldn't want to leave. You wouldn't want to leave before the before the uh, uh, repairs are complete. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I'm sure we we still have to acquire maybe additional hand weapons. I think we're all pretty well loaded for bear, but um, maybe acquire some stuff or get into. uh, I'm sure we have ammo on the ship. We just didn't have it on when it's on the surface. But, um, or uh, also get uh, um, into trouble. On, is it Cymbeline we're going to? Cymbeline system, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's something we can get into in trouble in Cymbeline. We could also spend some time re- maybe doing some z- uh, Zoom meetings there and reaching out to some of our contacts, contacts around the galaxy and get some updates on things. I mean, I think Les just did a great job. Remind us where we are, what, two years <laughs> into this adventure? <laughs> well, when did we start we playing? playing? I think it might be closing in on two years. Hold on. I, 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 I can actually answer that question because I have been uh, reconfiguring the YouTube channel um, and dividing up. I, all, I had all of our videos. We had like 220 videos that we've done uh, on YouTube, and they were of all different kinds of games and stuff like that. Um, how many? Uh, how much money have you made off the fifty clicks you've gotten to your video? <laughs> there's, there's no money. I, 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 you know, I don't think I've gotten fifty clicks. I got to be honest with you. Uh, so, classic travel. We've had twenty-one videos, and let me go see. I'm going to go see the the earliest one is. Oh, I guess not. Uh, well, yeah, closing in on to you. So the earliest one that I can see here was logged uh, April twenty sixth, twenty twenty. So yeah, coming up on two years. It's April, two years. Yeah, twenty April April six, twenty twenty. We were like, well, let's just play this real quick. I mean, how long can this pandemic go on? Yeah, exactly. It's probably yeah. not that. You know, by the time we by the time we get done here, we'll have a couple of adventures. It'll be fun, and then nothing. I'll be out, I'll be out in the mosh pit again. <laughs> you know, crowd surfing, all the fun stuff. Well, so that that actually leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you guys about. You know, just to, to meta for a second. Um, you know, we're we're playing a rule set here that has a lot of bumps and nooks and crannies in it, right? There's a lot of things left out, that kind of stuff. Um, you guys have all said that you guys are enjoying playing this, and and I'm happy to DM it. I'm I'm enjoying DMing it. Um, but I wanted to ask if at some point we you guys thought it might be interesting to convert to a more modern version of Traveler, which which would be largely similar in rule sophistication to most rpgs that we that are yeah, most modern rpgs the you little black little RPGs, are you talking about pathfinder or are you talking about pathfinder games? 5e uh games? you know call of cthulhu you know the, the latest iterations okay i don't know or do you like this rule set and you're just like eight or better is good for me uh, yeah I, I like it, this is simple i don't have to I don't need to have uh, Mike or Don talk me through every rules every week. <laughs> I'm like, how do I do this again? And I go, oh, well, sorry, you didn't, uh, you didn't factor in these three uh, impulse um, turns into this. But yeah, yeah, I'll do whatever you want to do, Les. I'm I'm fine with what we have most of the time. I, I'm okay either way. I wanted to find out what you guys wanted to do. Uh, it's kind of like going to Westworld or Western World. You know, visiting the past. That's true. Good point. Yeah, if Eric, you, you, gonna... you want to play Boot Hill, I'm like, oh god, we can't play that system. <laughs> top secret. I always want to run we'll a top secret dead. game. I'll we'll be dead in Boot Hill in the first adventure. 
Eric, you you were about to say something. So, uh, um, I've been having a blast with um, these traveler games and um, um, whatever platform we use, I'm ha ha happy. All right, I'm I'm perfectly content to stay with the little black books. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of I mean, you guys, uh, uh, it's kind of fun from a DM standpoint where I go looking through the books and I'm like, there must certainly there's a rule that covers this. And no, no, there's no rule. <laughs> so I'm just like, well, how am I going to handle this this bullshit? My, because my, uh, I don't know. There's nothing going on. My original concern when we started playing this and I saw the original like stuff you were sending over looked like you know mimeograph paper or whatever like. They're not going to uh, factor to any of modern technology that we already have into this quote future. <laughs> and but I thought you've done a good job managing, you know, expectation and also describing what isn't. I don't think thoroughly described in, in the original literature. Well, one you, of the things you know, that I, uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. So, Les, that's I want to build on that because this is something I've mentioned to you before, but I'm going to uh, mention it again because I want to ask you. Uh -huh. This is hard on you, right? There's a this, lot of rules missing. There's not a lot of material for it. There's nowhere for you to go grab. You're taking on a big hit here. Are you okay with that? Yeah, Maybe absolutely. I gotta be honest. On him. I gotta be honest with you. I have been. I had wanted to do something like this for a long time, uh, and uh, it is. It is more onerous. I spend more time in prep for traveler games than I typically will do for any on a session by session basis than i typically would for another game absolutely probably twice as much um prep largely in part that has to do with the fact and i think you hit on it dan there's not a lot of material for this game and my oftentimes my preferred way of of dming is i take pre-made material and I'll add homebrew elements or I'll change things around and uh, while maintaining sort of the overall story arc of the of the pre-written, you know, other other person written material. There are there are teams out of there that go full on homebrew. They do everything. They create their own worlds and all that kind of stuff. I don't I don't typically do that. I don't have the time, frankly, <laughs> to create an entirely new world. But um, but largely what we're doing here in, in Traveler is is homebrewed so I've t i took the original books i added ai i add i i subtracted the uh you know i added more technology more reasonable reasonable technology the weird thing the weird thing about original traveler is it sort of has this it's like somebody said wow that dungeons and dragons game is really good let's take that and add laser guns yeah. um because they have the equipment list and like what do i need a spear gun for yeah why do yeah there, there's like an, an ep you know like this yeah. weird sort of uh you know uh fencing kind of stuff and then they overlaid it with all this very sort of feudal-esque aris space aristocracy um you know and i'm like where are the robots man <laughs> we need some robots uh no we've got space aristocracy and instead of spells they have psionics uh which i've always thought psionics is just stupid i'm not a huge fan so um, psionics is those for the weak of mind yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so but I, I just so i but periodically i like to reach out to you guys um especially when don's not here and uh because, <laughs> and 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 ask you know if so um if, it, if you guys are happy with it easier for you if we switched would there be more material yeah. I, I don't i don't think so i kind of like the sort of retro element that we have here um and 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 to uh to matt's point it's a simpler game uh you know you there's a couple of numbers you have to worry about um you have to worry about the order in which your stuff is in um and that's it i mean you know pathfinder can be a little a little freaking crunchy like, you know? I like, I, as much as i love our our, our a team stuff i would say a good quarter of our time is spent on rules luring back and forth to maximize our version now that sometimes yeah. benefits us sometimes doesn't benefit you but we don't have that here could you say uh blah 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 and we go yeah that sounds about right and we make that's right yeah whatever. yeah i don't think we've ever had a, like a, a real argument where we got like i'm sorry we've got to call we call it call our expert witness mike to the stand to <laughs> tell you why less is wrong <laughs> in like 15 long minutes long conversation yeah oh my god i have a rata from a dragon magazine though, right? of 1984 that tells you that uh <laughs> guy Gag versus mason that uh <laughs> that you were wrong with us. But, but we're not talking about going to pathfinder right you're just no about they have so so they have starfinder uh, they have starfinder but i've got i've got problems with that too <laughs> so <laughs> my problems with starfinder are the fact that they have 
guns and spells in the same thing. And I've always been of they the, want to do spell the same jammer, right? Yeah, they want to do spell jammer. So and it's like I've always been of the opinion that if you live in a society that has magic, uh, there are certain technological things that simply wouldn't get invented because they wouldn't need to be invented. Um, and if you have a society that has technology, you shouldn't have magic too. Uh, I think the two should be separate. If you want to have a, if you want to have a space game, have a space game. If you want to have a fantasy game, have a fantasy game. But you don't want to have a space fantasy game. I, I just and Starfinder is definitely a space fantasy game. There's another game called Numenera, which has a lot of the same elements, and I think it's frankly a much more sophisticated product than um, than Starfinder. Uh, but even then, they they do so much mixing of of you know technology and magic that it's sort of like it tries to be everything for everybody and i think it fails in that way like um, when you tell me you're like oh they got all the stuff on the on the drive you can read all the 80 source books and i can get like a character that's mid max like uh gordon's or mike's or something like mm -hmm. nope i'm good i'm good yep. just limping around with what i got yep <laughs> and so the, uh, more what i was thinking of is that just recent i think it's just recently mongoose who's the parent company uh, yeah. yeah who does traveler recently came out with I believe they recently came out with, or they announced they are coming out with Traveler, and I think it's sixth edition. Um, Maybe and check it out when it comes. Yeah. So, and I just didn't know if you guys had heard anything about that. Personally, perfectly happy going the way we're going, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys were also happy with that because if, if no, you guys I'm were happy, not, like I said, the things that I that I was really concerned about when we first started, you sent us over like the mimeograph sheets. So, like, here's the equipment list, and like. I can get a vest and apparently a, a space there. <laughs> that doesn't sound that awesome, but like, and then well, there's no AI in there at all. Don't I'm like, who's, who's carrying a sword on a starship? It's just not going to happen. Nobody's carrying around a big knife. Um, you know, it's You're like, are you low tech? Do you need a club with a spike in it? Like, I don't know. Can I afford that? <laughs> That's just crazy. So. <laughs> and you get, uh, and you get skills in it. Like I have broadsword minus one. And I'm like, on what planet are you going to need that? I don't know. Uh, all right, so we will uh, we will carry on as per until somebody complains. Can we can we have one other uh, one other discussion? How come Traveler, which has messed me up for my my entire life, uh, is does not spell like Traveler the word Traveler, like Traveler? It's got two L's. Yeah, I'm like, who added that extra L for space? I, is Bongo's Bongo's a British company? Uh, probably. Well, I mean, originally it was GDW, right? Which is a British company. Yeah. Games Design Workshop. Yeah, they're they are British. Maybe it's the British spelling. Yeah, it, it could is. be because I mean the original Traveler was like sort of like Romani Gypsy or Drifter or whatever is kind mm -hmm. of its mean. And this one it feels like that's kind of what we are. We're kind of like beat up. We were Firefly before Firefly was cool. Space gypsies. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's where the extra L comes in. Is is a maybe a British spelling. Okay. My entire life has messed me up when I have to spell the word Traveler. <laughs> that's rank speculation again on my part, but I don't know. So, but yeah, but it seems reasonable. All right. So, uh, but that being the case, you guys are, um, it does, it, you know, it takes six, almost seven days before you begin to, with a slice of lime. Uh, and a lot of it is manual, right? You're pretty, uh, pretty far away from gin's influence. Um, and a lot of driving the slice of lime is a manual process. I mean, there are automated processes, but you don't have an AI on here. Um, that sounds it's, rough. Let me know how it turns out, Captain. <laughs> it's only it's only when the slice of lime is in proximity to gin where gin can step in and sort of uh, and sort of help you. Uh, at Tufik, you'll remember that you got zero help from the from the ship when it came to uh, you know sensor arrays and stuff like that. So, um, but as you begin to come back into Cymbeline space, suddenly. The subspace radios start firing up. You're getting pinged by various AI. Where are you going? You know they're they're um, you know they're scoping out. You know what ship is this? That kind of stuff. And and you guys get hailed essentially from uh, from one of the big the big star station that you guys went to for Cymbeline Station. And um, basically they're like, "Who are you? And what do you want?" And you guys are like, "This is the slice of lime, late Tufik. We are coming in to Cymbeline Station. We're having our our primary." vessel is having repairs there they're like oh yeah yeah well you remember you that kind of thing so uh it's an old code but it checks out should i let them in kind of thing sure, okay go ahead so you guys end up uh um you guys get ported over to um uh doc 1473 space doc 1473 where you can see uh the gin and tonic is right there and it's actually there's a little bay next to it a little um 
uh, where you can pull the slice of lime in without without pulling it into the gin and tonic itself. So there's a little side bay. Um, and uh, you can see that there is still work being done on the ship. There are guys in vac suits. So the ship is sort of integrated into the dock. Um, so there's portion a portion of the gin and tonic is like inside the station and a portion of the gin and tonic is in vacuum and there's the various seals that go around it uh so you can see like guys in in vac suits are sort of like jetting around with little you know little gas jets and and working on various sensor arrays and things like that and captain black you could see that oh they're working on the they're working on the sensor array on the you know the forward sensor array there and you could spot that there are there are additional sensors being attached and calibrated um you can't see what's going on inside uh you know the dock but it's obvious that there's there's still a variety of things going on uh when it, as pertains to ship repairs it doesn't look complete okay okay it's not a fully operational battle station it is does not seem to be a fully operational <laughs> battle station. it seems to yeah. be it seems to be something that they're working on and your trained eye captain uh um you know kind of looks over the the superstructure of the gin and tonic and you can see some at, at first you're like well they haven't installed anything and then you're like wait a second what is that and you look over and you can see that there does seem to be some sort of emplacement which is cunningly concealed uh you know with a with a with a sort of an, a, a shell and some sort of um, mechanism so yeah on first blush even you could not see the uh where the gun ports have been in, in placed but as and on, at second you could you do see that there are you could see at least one you don't see any of the others but you do see at least one emplacement which would be some sort of some sort of weapon uh but it's cunningly concealed very well done very awesome. pleased all right looks like we gotta get into some trouble here we're waiting for a shift we probably should get an estimate before we uh, so you're so you're cleared to to pull in. You pull the shuttle in to, uh, uh, into the into the bay. Uh, you know, a field rises behind you, and the vacuum is pumped out. And you, you know, the atmosphere comes in, and you get the all clear. Uh, Do we bring weapons on the station. Well, yeah. Um, so okay, I'm packing this. Sy so Cymbeline is a is a is a funny place. It's a little bit like. Greenprint in that they are sort of okay with weaponry as long as you don't make a huge production out of it. So like Coffin carrying that big <laughs> giant assault rifle that he has through the through the the decks of the station, a cause for concern. But if if you're just walking around with body pistols or even a even a regular automatic pistol tucked into your belt where it, you know where it can't be easily seen. Yeah, unless you, unless something bad happens and you find yourself uh, having to talk to police, um, you'd probably be fine. Um, <clears throat> shotgun under an uh, uh, overcoat. As long as it's not out, probably not a problem. I mean, if you if you if you, if you walk if you're anything under the overcoat. What's that? It's the it's the robe he got from the security guys back on two. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm assuming you have some sort of like shoulder sling so that the gun, you know, as you're walking is sort of like ported around behind or some sort of like web gear that you've got it tucked into. So it's not like swinging all over the place as you walk through things. Um, but yeah, as long as as long as you're not like at port arms, uh, you know, with a with an obvious firearm or laser yeah. weapon, you should be fine. Um, I, I have a much more um, pressing problem, though, of of course um the whole mi missing arm thing that's true so right, i guess okay. you would be at port arm uh, okay. if you're carrying a, carrying a shotgun so uh all right so yeah you guys get into the station um you get through clearance you know there's a there's a brief period of time about 25 minutes where uh you know they're checking everything you have to go through um a field sensor to make sure that you didn't bring back any any fun uh, you know, pathogens or anything from wherever you came back from. Um, and uh, you begin to, you, you, you begin to clock a couple of subspace matches, messages, uh, including um, one from Sergey that says, Hey, you know, when you get back, you guys are late coming back. Where are, you know, <laughs> where are you? Um, when you get back, uh, call me and we'll, we'll meet up. I've got uh, some stuff I need to talk to you about. All right. Let's go look for Sergey. Where's he at? 
Well, Sergey, I mean, you go basically to his, um, you, you ping him on, uh, you, and by the way, those of you with Nate Lace, your Lace begins to activate again. So you have maps, you have calls, that kind of stuff. Um, so Sergey uh, has an office in, in the station and, and it's where you met him before. And uh, you would probably go there to meet with him. Okay. Ooh, cool art. Here's Sergey's office. It's very much the office of a importer exporter. You remember Sergey? Um, that's what he looks like. Very sort of Slavic sort of looking fellow. And he's like, I'm glad you're back. Welcome, welcome. You are uh, several days later than I expected. I trust there was no problems with the delivery. Oh boy. Uh, there were problems, but we were able to handle them. Uh, and if I may interrupt, uh, just ask, where is your arm? Um. <laughs> That was part my of my arm. Um, uh, you know, my, my arm detaches, and um, I um, left it um, on the ship. Uh, you know, it, sometimes it aches a bit. You know, so, um, yeah, just uh, just a thing. You know, my um, arthritis. You know, I haven't had my CBD in days. You know, so so I. I I'm sorry. I I, CBD. <laughs> So um, I, I, I know it's surprising and, and unsightly. And um, as, as soon as I can um, get some CBD, I'm going to take that. It's great for aches and pains. And then I'm going to pop my arm back on. <clears throat> OK. He's silent for a moment. Uh, but he's like, well, all right. <laughs> Hold on. I'm, uh, uh, I'm tweeting. It detaches. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you notice before? Where's your arm? It detaches. Um, Better than your penis. <laughs> exactly. There's, a, there's an oh. 80s reference. But uh, so um, so he's like, okay, well, so several things have happened. So first, first and foremost, basically, Sergey explains. He's like, look, ship's not done yet. Uh, we're finalizing some of the things. There's a little bit. We probably have four or five days more worth of work before it's before it's. Um, 100% ready to go. Uh, we also have it set up if you want to take advantage of it. And it's something we provide for all our customers. Um, we have out uh, in the latter uh, section of the of the star system uh, out by um, uh, there's a there's an AP belt about 10 astronomical units away from away from Cymbeline the star uh, where we retain some old shuttles and and various kinds of uh, various kinds of um, uh, scrap ships and, and and things of that nature where if you wanted to go out and do a little training and and potentially uh, Is he know, giving us a loner. <laughs> no, he says, well, basically he's saying when your ship is done, if you want to go out and do a little target practice and get familiar okay. with how these guns work, we have a place for that. And we're happy. We'll be, we'd be happy to let you use it. And it's, and it's in system. So if you look at the system setup, there's the pri So there's the star Cymbeline, and then very close to it is the planet. It's, it's in the habitable zone. And then above that planet uh, is, is, Cymbeline Station. So there are several things in orbit around it. Cymbeline Station is the largest. This is where you guys are now. You have not gone down out of the planet. Um, near in between, if you go a little bit further away from the thing, there's a uh, there's a destroyed planet, essentially a small asteroid belt. Beyond that is a large-ish gas giant, which essentially is the fuel station for the for this system. Then you go, there's more asteroids, and then another gas giant, and then out at the at essentially the the furthest reach of this of this particular system, about 10 astronomical units away from the away from the star, is another much larger asteroid field um, where they have sort of parked a couple of targets in in uh, sort of something akin to geostationary orbit, and um, they allow people. I mean, you guys aren't the first people that they've surreptitiously hung guns for, so um, they're like, you know, if you want to try it out, that's where people go try it out. Thank Is that you. something you want to do? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we did have there were some complications. 
uh, so we were, um, so Sergey tells you that, so first things first, uh, I've met your friend, Miss Yamazaki. She was actually come, she, she came to Cymbeline about a week and a half ago. We had had some difficulties with the AI uh, and upgrading the AI. There was some anomalous readings and some anomalous um, uh, Talk about Jim? Yeah, and with Jin, there were some anomalous readings and some and some issues that we had when we tried to do the standard, uh, you know, f um, weapon related upgrades to the AI. Um, Miss Yamazaki came, uh, arrived on station just a day or two after we did that and looked me up, and basically uh, she had, I, I uh, she said that. She uh, had all the credentials and obviously, um, you know, Jin knew her. Uh, and so um, she actually ported in one of Spofulam's technologists to assist our guys with the with the AI upgrades and we're able to complete that. But um, uh, because of because of the difficulties, uh, she also uh, paid a part of the bill. So uh, she paid another 250 kilo credits off that off of the bill. So in addition to the half a mega credit that that Sergey is giving you for delivering the medicine off the bill. Um, Spafilam's representative, Miss Yamazaki, came out here, um, helped with some of the issues associated with Jin being upgraded for the weapons, brought in her own technologists, and um, also contributed another 250K. So there's that. Um, yeah, apparently she learned that you guys were here. Um, it was, she had come here, I, she, she let, she let Sergey know that um, somebody, you know, some drone named Emix had found out that you guys that you guys were here and had filed an, uh, a system lien on the on the ship. Uh, and Miss Yamazaki apparently was CC'd on that and responded to it by coming here and taking care of whatever legal issues needed to be taken care of. So my understanding is that's gone away now. That problem, but apparently this uh, Emix drone was interested in um well there was some there was some talk that he was going to uh sequester the ship until debts were paid and something like that i don't know how that was none of my business so i don't know how that went but uh your your miss yamazaki took care of it in whatever legal fashion her corporation did I mean, that's all great but i thought we were like in a in a shady area getting like illegal arms attached and we gotta like, deal with lawyers and stuff over here well, that brings me to my second point. There is a representative of the Terran Legal Authority here, a man named, a human named Kiev Smitchy, who has, who came to, uh, who we found um, making uh, queries about the location of the personnel uh, and crew of the gin and tonic. Um, so I went to see him uh, to find out what there was a problem since we were doing the work. Uh, he basically uh, said th that uh, he needed to talk to you when you returned on station. Now, mm -hmm. I understand that not everyone wants or needs to talk to the Terran legal authority. Well, so if, if, this is a, if, uh, if this is a problem, we can resolve. <laughs> Well, before we put him in a potato sack, let me, uh, I'd like to talk to him. Cat, no, Cat no, 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 nothing like that. Meaning if uh, if you need to leave the system covertly. No, no, Sergey, I totally get it, wink. Yeah, nothing bad will happen to the guy. No, no, it won't depend on you at all, I, I promise. But um, he, did, he did leave word with me when we talked to him that he would uh, uh, like to have a word with you, if at all possible, upon your return. I'm fine with talking to him, Captain. Are you okay to talk to him, or do you want to keep uh, arm's length, or what do you want to do? We can bring everybody, but I'm afraid the doctor's going to whip out one of his tiger penises, and that's going to start a whole thing. I could use a bear penis instead. Um, secondly, I have a feeling I the Terran legal question, authority will have something to say about that. Before I go anywhere, I got to go to the, the high-end uh, fashion area, spend a few credits to get replace my, my beautiful Lando Calrissian trade cloak. <laughs> that funny, that bravely gave guys. its uh, bravely was wrapped around uh, uh, Doyle's groin for some period of time. <laughs> you throwing that one away? Yeah, just just keep it. I burned it. <laughs> what were you saying, Dan? So I was trying to talk to you guys, and and then I realized I was on mute. You weren't just ignoring me. Um, so two things: one, yes, travelers, the UK spelling less. Is it? Oh, two, okay, thank you. Um, we, from what we know, the last conversation we have with the Terran authorities, they were basically kind of take, turn into blind eye for the time being because they're not really big fans of the USA anyway. 
Um, so yeah, I think it's worth giving them a chat if you're willing to take that on. Right. You talked to some people at, at Calgary, if I recall correctly. You, when you left Greenprint, you, you hightailed it for Calgary. You may have talked to them at Calgary. You may have talked to them at Junction. Um, but basically, yeah, you're, you're, the word you got from the people you talked to is like, look, you're a long way away from Terra. Um, this is a long way away from something that people in Terra have, have a lot of time to deal with. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, f- causing a, a, causing a fret, uh, with one of our, um, you know, with the, the least important, uh, race of Sofans in the, in known space right now, um, is not high pri- a high priority issue. So it's yeah, kind of it's weird. it's actually kind of weird that they there is a representative here at Cymbeline who I, I'm wants that, to talk to you. Yeah, I'm going to say that it's got to be good for us, Kevin Doyle, not bad because we're we're on we're all on uh, Team Human still, or at least most of us are. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so that this is yeah, I'm sure if, he, if there's anything he has to share, maybe we can get some info about our Ursa Ursa problem or something else. Yep. Good well, plan. this. So what Sergey could also tell you is this guy Smitchy is is a a relatively minor functionary in the Terran legal authority, the TLA, um, but he's been in Cymbeline system for a while. Um, Sergey suspects that Smitchy's real job here is to sort of keep an help keep an eye on Terran interests and make sure that the Cymbeline uh, Kaguk conflict doesn't get too sticky. Or, or or expand further than it already has. Ooh, so basic, basically, he's part of the TLA detachment, and there's probably several other group detachments that are here in Cymbeline. They probably have their counterparts in Kaguk who are trying to make sure that whatever goes on between Cymbeline and Kaguk, that it doesn't it doesn't reach Ember. All right, so let's go. To, are we taking everybody? Are we going to take the whole posse? Are you me, Captain, or what are you going to do? Well, he's like, before you go, I have additional things to tell you. Oh, <laughs> all right. Hold on. Let's talk about Melvin, shall Melvin. we? Oh yes. Sorry. We d- so you said no questions asked. You said you, said you were going to weld him to the prow. Yeah, you said you're going to weld him to the prow. Uh, well, we do have we did have some slight events of interest that might be of interest to you regarding Melvin. Uh, for one, let me just tell you, Melvin is safe and sound. We have him in a in a secure warehouse guarded by drones. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we've we've made sure that it is under observation at all times. We did that because a couple of things happened um, uh, while you were gone. So first, uh, we we had a an attempted break in at the warehouse where we had Melvin stores. Now the break-in was unsuccessful. Our our uh, our security drones uh, were able to uh, keep the, uh, uh, the the uh, the burglars from from entering our uh, our um, our security area. However, uh, we were also able to. Uh, but the fact that uh, uh, there's very little in that particular that particular secure area except Melvin makes me wonder if perhaps these burglars were after Melvin. Uh, there was very little. In that in that warehouse, that would otherwise be attractive to burglars, and they did seem technically proficient. Obviously, our drones were were more proficient. We did get a couple of uh, images uh, from security, and it basically shows you a picture, and it is one human dressed in 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 armor and obviously bearing a weapon and a series of tools, uh, and an Ursae, um Next to him, also uh, also bearing weapons and tools, and carrying one of those clubs that they have those ceremonial clubs in a in sort of a baldric on his back. Oh, there's our old friend. It is not. It is not Kick Bandiers. It was not him. You you would recognize if it was Kick, uh, but it's it it was not him. It's, this is this is an Ursa that you don't think you've seen before. The guy looks familiarish, but frankly, all humans look the same. 
you know, comparatively. So it could be anything. Anyway, they look loaded for bear. They have a couple of still images of these guys. Essentially, what looks like it happened is they came pretty well prepared to deal with both security measures and and uh, both static and active security measures, uh, you know, tools and weapons. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, ran into some problems and were, and were spooked off. Sergey will admit that, you know, when when their alarms went off, they they the, the security drones activated, which, you know, obviously some of Sergey's guys reacted to. So it could be that they skedaddled before they got caught because it was going to take them more time to get in the warehouse than they thought they they had. Um, but yeah, a human and an Ursa. So he goes, we did a little tracking back to see where these guys went. And uh, about uh, uh, 30 hours later, they went to they went to a, a, one of the local um you know, sort of uh, hotels uh, on station, stayed in the hotel uh, for about 30 hours, ordering room service. I just cannot abide that Ursay that Urse food. It's horrible. Ordered room service the whole time until they left and they went uh, to the docks, um, uh, not the repair docks, the uh, uh, trafficking docks, uh, where they went to a ship called the Penny Dreadful under a Captain Lamante. They entered the ship, stayed in for a little while, and then uh, uh, and then left and went back to their hotel. Uh, we stopped watching them at this point uh, because, frankly, we had other fish to fry. Awesome. Um, then I received about... Uh, hold this thought just for a second. I got to go... Uh, I'll be right back. See a man about a space horse? I got it. <laughs> was that <laughs> less having to do that, or was that? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, you need to uh, drain the affronty, or uh, yeah, exactly. or uh, <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of any other peeing uh, space parables. <laughs> um, gotta go see the affront. See the affront. <laughs> uh, so what's the uh, what's the uh, Ursa weapon called? Uh, the big uh, the big uh, club thing they have. It's the big phallic club, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I, think, yeah. I think we were just calling it a big phallus. Yeah, this big bear phallus club. Maybe I'm giving less too much credit for having the big bear phallus club, but you know, he's, <laughs> he's a friend. I'll I'll do that for him. <laughs> this will be on the recording. I hope he comes back here someday to try to. <laughs> They had my back about my manhood. <laughs> All right, so hold on. Now we've got a dozen things going on here, right? I think we need to split forces. I, I think uh, Doyle for sure should be like keeping eye, eye, eye on our uh, our friend. Uh, Mel Sorry, drink a whole pot of tea. <laughs> We're kind of come up with a uh, uh, a space um, euphemism. Euphemism there. Huh? <laughs> you're, you're using your uh, Ursa space club, draining the space, or you know, <laughs> to working on it. Yeah, seeing that. See, yeah, seeing the affront. I have to go see the affront real quick. I had to purge the coolant towers. There you go. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there we go. Um, so then Sergey says, "Look, you know, uh, this is a while back, uh, but about uh, about forty hours later, we got a message um, that somebody was." that somebody somebody reached out to us by digital means uh and asked if uh they described the thing in the tank with a fair amount of precision and asked if we would be willing to sell it and they offered us a mega credit for it wow um because hard to resist. <laughs> well, it's like, look, you're customers of mine, and I'm, I trust that, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, when it comes to mounting illegal weapons onto ships, your word is your bond. Uh, so, um, you know, he's like, look, you know, I, a mega credit is tempting, but I, I, uh, um, if I, if I sold my customers' property out from under them on a regular basis, I would very soon have no customers now, wouldn't I? Um uh -huh. We rejected the offer, uh, and um, and actually tried to. They will describe it as like basically we tried to use because it was a digital. It came. It was entirely 
digital. Uh, it was, you know, um, the, the, all the offer, all the stuff came via digital and it was uh, all text text based, no, no AV. He's like, we tried to um, figure out where the message came from. And we had some of our, some of our guys do, uh, we actually had some of our guys who are talented in this regard and an AI, with AI support, try to track the message back. We did track it back to a secure terminal in one of the many secure terminal uh, centers throughout the station. And we were able to reverse, uh, and they have they have cameras mounted on them like ATMs, and we were able to get a picture. And the person who sent the messages was an Urse, not the same Urse that tried to break into the thing, but a different one. Does now we were picture of the guys just so we can try to identify if it's no, he doesn't he doesn't have a picture because I it's difficult to find pictures of space bears, but. Um, <laughs> You know, Any bear will do this. Like, yeah, you know, Googling space bear gets you a whole different kind of picture a lot of times. Uh, like so you have to be very, you have to be very careful. <laughs> if you put a Paddington bear in his blue coat up there and just said this was Kick Van Deer, be like, what about okay. Winnie the Pooh? Yeah, Win <laughs> yeah, Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, for sure. We just need to Photoshop that big club into his hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a, a another Ursa. Now there are there are a fair amount of Ursa's, you know, on station. They come here, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, but that was odd. He thought it was interesting is the word he uses that we had two attempts, attempts, uh, to acquire Melvin by two different Ursae within the course of 72 hours. Um, we moved Melvin to a different location, a, a more secure location, uh, increased, uh, the security there and have had no instances uh, of uh, anything further. This was probably four or five days ago when this when this all happened. Interesting. Well, I'm sorry that caused you uh, that that extra stress. Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad we got a chance to talk about this because my guess is no. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm a businessman, so I thought I would ask you: Would you be willing to part with Melvin? No. Uh, I, you, yeah. We're not in the like we got in this whole thing because we, we got in the business out of the business of selling selling living creatures to other people. This is how we got this mess in the first place. So uh, we're not we're not selling anything. But I think the sure like to find a way to talk to Melvin or find out what he is. I have kept uh, I have kept my uh, um, my people away from him, and typically what I've done is I've used uh, um, a, uh, androids uh, and robots to uh, and drones to move to move Melvin and his tank uh, from here to there. And uh, I have generally kept to that when it comes to his security measures. Generally speaking, he doesn't have people near him. He has machines near him that, that basically keep an eye on him. Okay. Uh, for whatever reason, Melvin can be unnerving to Sofans for reasons. I, I myself, uh, uh, you know, was told about this and went and took, took my own look. And uh, I have to say, it is an odd and disturbing looking creature. Yes. Yeah, I wish we could. And interesting that so many people want to try to buy it. It's a bit of a mystery. It's also, uh, it was also interesting that so many people, like we were out there by ourselves. We talked to nobody until we got to here and that there's multiple interested parties uh, potentially that found us. That found us. Now, granted, it sounds like your original party somehow figured out that we were there. Maybe they could have pulled footage from the dead ship or something. I don't know. But somehow they they, they could say they found us. But if there's multiple parties, that's more concerning. Uh, I would say, this is this is at least what I'm thinking. We need to meet with this Terran representative, and we need to lay a trap for the clear uh, attempt on, on taking Melvin from us by any means necessary. Something that you know Doyle can have his big gun out for. Well, certainly. So Sergey will explain himself when, you know, he's like, look, I'll I'll give you he, he basically says, look, I'll give you a mega credit or in, in cash or, or not cash, but you know what he means. Or I'll knock a mega credit off the cost of the repairs. And he goes, look, my my uh, my reasons are simple. I think I can extract more than a mega credit from this other buyer, this Ursa buyer. Yes. Uh, and make money off of it, and you guys don't lose anything. Um, that's my only reason for it. He's like, honestly, I have no interest in whatever this thing is. Um, but he's like, I'm a businessman. 
Yeah, I'm gonna, it's not like, for me, guys. It's not about the money. It's about we got we got it's into the principle. Yes, we've gotten our first adventure by taking on slavers, and even though we don't know what this creature is, it's basically the same principle. Well, there's something. I mean, it's a it's a it's a dude in a tank. It's a mega credit. <laughs> the voice of <laughs> the voice of reason, Doctor Wegg. <laughs> Money right, talks, so that, and space bullshit walks. So he'll tell you, he says, "Look, look, uh, you know, we still have three or four days, four, five at the most, before the uh, before the repairs are going to be complete. Uh, at that point, if you want to take it out for target practice, or you want to, or you want to skip Cymbeline altogether and head out to some other place, can do that too. Um, you know, the jump drives are perfectly. You know, we haven't. He's like, we haven't done anything to your jump drives. There, you guys have." pretty sophisticated jump drives as it is um we've focused entirely on the weapons and, and augmenting your ai to be able to control those weapons okay interesting okay thank you yeah thank okay you. so yeah so what do you want to do from here what, what time is it it's like we got basically an hour of uh, hour 15 hour, hour and 10 yeah i would say that we need to uh, like i said that's my thought is that we need to tr lay a trap for that would be burglars uh, or whoever comes again, um, and uh, we got to talk to this uh, this alliance dude. We can either do it together or separately, but it might be better to divide up um, just in case, at least for the short term. Okay. What is it we're gonna do with Melvin? And uh, you need to buy an arm. Yep. Oh yeah, I forgot. Well, I attached a uh, bear penis. <laughs> <laughs> It's all like <laughs> hey, this is, this is six six. <laughs> Gotta get aroused to be able to hold this weapon. Oh, god. Oh, god. oh my god. I didn't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody get me a Tony the Tiger poster. Um it's right. great. <laughs> there we go. The uh I forgot about your arm. So maybe we uh you know, how do you want to do this? Uh, like, it shouldn't take us that long to go meet with this uh, person. So maybe we should go meet with this person, and maybe Doc and, uh, and and Eric and Doyle can get his armory attached. Okay. Or new arm? Are you gonna buy a new arm? Um, my plan was to shop around, um, see what arms are of of available. Um, I um, don't need anything. Fancy, uh, just a, a couple of um, inbuilt lasers, and um, uh, you know, no, uh, this is something <laughs> that just works. Uh, um, if if it's possible to to get an um, android arm that or a cybernetic arm that works roughly like a human arm, then I'm happy. So um, Sergey will be like, well, there are several fine cybernetic. Uh, um, places here uh that you can get an arm in fact depending on how much money you have mm -hmm. um you know we could we could look at the cybernetics chart that he happens to have uh there in his office well you know um my um previous uh, arm um broke back there on that planet so <laughs> I, I could um use an um update uh, um, I, I would love to see um any options you have if we have some time oh should we get workers comp for for his new arm well do you guys want to use some of the ship's money for him it's coming out of the shared funds i i would say yes because sooner or later one somebody else is going to get a blim blown off or something and i want to i want to know i have that option so i guess so i have fun? i have are you can you guys see this uh spreadsheet uh no yeah i can sort of see it hold on uh, sure, there's a, a you know cash machine we need to knock over on the station here if we need to. I mean, did I say that out loud on the recording? That's wrong. <laughs> okay, can you guys see spreadsheet now? Yes. Okay. Wow. All right. Huh. So uh, there are a variety of augmentations and things that you can do. So generally speaking, what you you're doing is cyber arm, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the standard arm replacement, and that's three kilo credits, three thousand. Um, then there are other elements that you can, that you can, so you can put armor on it. Uh, you can, uh, um, do the shoulder mount. You're probably going to have to have the shoulder mount anyway, since the, the, the location of the, of the severage, 
uh, was that you're going to need the bones there are probably pretty damaged despite Dr. Wagner's best efforts. I mean, he's only yeah. human. Um, so you're probably going to need the, the, the shoulder mount, but then you can have things like, um, you know, you can put real skin on it. Uh, that's going to be relatively cheap, reinforced joints, um, yeah, a, a tentacle arm. arm, you know, that is kind of cool. Uh, super size arm sounds awesome. Super size, you know, that kind of thing. But then you could talk about like different kinds of armor. You could talk about like different kinds of augments. So um, all of these things could be attached to arms. Some of them are not going to make a lot of sense. You don't well, put gills on an arm. Motion detector, but... just so we can have an alien scene there. Yeah, motion <laughs> detectors, kill <laughs> displays. <laughs> um you know uh you know various kinds of things can openers bottling can <laughs> openers you also have the opportunity for built-in weapons uh so uh you gotta get the chainsaw. laser chainsaw arm uh <laughs> micro missile launcher shotgun arm uh you know like a stuff dr dr Wider, could you chop my arm off i want a chainsaw arm now <laughs> absolutely you could have it you can have it loaded with speedware so it gives you initiative roll good smart you do need for for a, a smart weapon you definitely need to have the smart gun link added in there um uh just to make sure so that that you can control it you have you have neural lace right I do not, and um, actually, that's mm. something else that I, I, I want to talk about because um, stubbornly for nearly two years now, I have a re refused new release just because I, I um, coffin has um, new roses and bad PTSD, and um, he's a, coffin has some significant mental issues, as you as you all possibly have noticed um so um he, he, <laughs> i wasn't gonna say anything come around <laughs> and he would like to if possible get some um neural lace too um but do i have only a, a, a 100 is it, is it 100 is it six, 69 credits now these are kilo credits and this is basically your share of the the, the after ta uh, after after expense profits of the operation of the ship for the last five months or so i think we're in or six months we're in june right now was that, uh, yeah, was that price list also in like kilo that? credits i'm sorry was that price list also in kilo credits i think there's two different uh uh, they were not pricing denomination killer credits. These were yeah. listed. So yeah, they're they're not. So here's the thing. So these are actually um, some of these are actually quite cheap. So yeah. these are not uh, uh, killer credits, but um, at a zero here, uh, basically. So for this is going to be 15 killer credits for the shoulder mount, that kind of stuff. So we're we're adding a zero on this. This, by the way, is for an entirely different game, by the way, so um, that I've absconded with and are using here. Um, this is great. So we'll add a zero. Uh, it's possible. So here's the thing is neural lace installation takes about two weeks mm -hmm. and you're pretty much down that whole time because not the first week has to do with the surgery. And then the next week is sort of recovery and learning how to use it uh, because it can be, it can be quite disconcerting, especially getting neural laced uh, later in life. Um, you know, that kind of, it's, it's fair thing, but that's about, uh, 30 kilo credits all on its own. So about 30,000 uh, okay. to get to get neural lace installed. Uh, I have one. So I'd be happy to install. The neural lace is customized to the individual. Uh, so if you give him, you took out Chimera's neural lace, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you put Chimera's neural lace in there, there's going to be all kinds of problems. I thought you I put it in yourself. No, you put your, her eye in yourself. The eye is fine. The eye is just a, simply a cybernetic eye, which he has, still has mounted on the back of his skull, um, which is an interesting place for it, but he can't be snuck up on, I'll tell you that. Um, but neural lace is a whole different thing. It, it, is, it is customized and tuned to the individual's brain structure, um, you know, their their fields, the, uh, you know, their brain waves and stuff like that. So, yeah, putting it, it Chimera's, Chimera's neural lace would not work for Mr. Doyle. I'm afraid that if I put her neural lace in me, it'll help her find me. It'll be an eyes of Laura Mars situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Nobody. I guess I have to turn it into a doily. 
Well, you could certainly use it for a trophy. If you ever run into her again, you could just shake it at her. Um, <laughs> hey, look what I got. <laughs> Want this back? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe you could lure her in by the promise of reinstalling her neural lace uh, for cheap. You know, when, when or I get on the same planet as she, as or the same town, I am gonna make it up. To, I am gonna sow peace. Peace, I'd say peace. <laughs> Just, okay. It takes, I, it takes two to make peace, man. You, you, you yeah, will recall that you hit her several times with a spoon. I have an irresistible, charming plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, and, as, and as the DM, I cannot wait to hear this because I think it's just going to be classic. Um, all right. But yeah, so you're, I, I'll send you this thing. You can decide. Um, but if you want, it would mean that you guys would be staying in... Cymbeline system longer than expectations. Reasonably Why speaking. Why couldn't I install it? Why couldn't he buy it and I install it? I suppose you could. I mean. Well, then uh, we wouldn't be stuck there for that long. You would need, uh, well, he still, he still needs to have it tuned to him, right? I mean, it's part of it is the installation. Part of it is him getting used to having it. And if he's going to. Oh. If he's going to stack a cyber arm on top of it, he's going to need that lace to control that. Um, well, I think he just means that we could leave then and do it like on the ship. Oh, yeah. Okay. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Wait. wait, wait. Um, it, it, it just means I'm out of action for two weeks. Maybe I could get the lace installed and the arm installed just before we leave for a long jump it would work yes and then do it on the ship instead of staying here yeah have the entire all the surgeries done at once and then dr wagner would lead you through calibration yeah um so so, so like that, that's my um plans so let, let's let, let's um uh, shelve or, or this for, for now let's wait until we decide where we're gonna go next and then if, if, if there's time I will, sorry i'll get the you gotta check the kids i i do but but, but um, done. Uh, <laughs> fries are done <laughs> <laughs> oh my god all right um uh, let's figure out where we're gonna go next and if there's time I, i'll get the surgeries done okay all right cool i will send you the uh uh the cybernetics list Thank for you. your arm and i'll um i'll also outline some of the basic things that you're going to need to have uh to pay for like the shoulder mount and the, and the cybernetic arm itself but then you can talk about what you want to have attached to it now keep in mind you can't like if you see like 17 things that you want uh you can't you can't swiss army knife this thing um mm -hmm. a gun and a tool is, and and maybe a sensor is about as far as you can go. Copy. Right. I think uh, if if uh, uh, if we look at uh, Captain Black, Captain Black, you have a gun and a tool associated with yours, right? I got guns. Yes, I do. <laughs> Somebody said the other night, "Welcome to the crossbow show." <laughs> <laughs> about i was just like oh my god they're like welcome to the crossbow show I'm, oh my god <laughs> you're out of the game um right back <laughs> all right see ya. uh all right so so there's that you guys could probably make those arrangements sergey could probably make arrangements for that as well help you sort of get the, the best the best guys uh and um if you're willing to help him you probably don't even have to help him with the, with the costs if you don't want to but uh I, I think he's got enough money to handle it um the, from his shares of the uh of the you know the profits so far but that's up to you did you want to did you want to even mention to sergey the two pallets of bourbon or the 1.8 pallets of bourbon <laughs> um i think we want to see the uh the final bill first before we start negotiating with our pallets of bourbon right don't we it's up to you. I mean, you could always offload. I mean, it's a, it's a cargo like yeah. anything else at this point. Yeah, so that's what I'm right. if you want to keep um, a pallet for yourself, I mean, it's still it's still a hundred grand 
uh, if you keep a whole palette for yourself, um, you know, I mean, the bribe, the, the bribe factor on that. Imagine, imagine you had a hundred bottles of Pappy Van Winkle 2021 20, that you could lug around and just give to people that you wanted them to do what you wanted to do. That would be uh, uh, a, a, a significant incentive. <laughs> You know, Weber Jix is all about that plan. He loves. I was going to say, Weber, I'd, I'd kind of leave that call out to you. Is that something? I don't you think I need a hundred bottle, but let, let's 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 ask Sergey. Like, let's tell me we have at least one case available and see. Uh, you know, just what see if he thinks thinking. he can help us offload it and yeah. what profit we could get. Yep. Okay. But all he right, also uh, has tight, uh, take the tiger and bear penises to offload as well. <laughs> you want to do so? Uh, so Sergey takes you aside and says, "I've had several inquiries about tiger and bear penis. Um, my understanding <laughs> is that you know how to get them, uh, and maybe even have a stock. Uh, so if you do, you know that would be perfect. So because there's well, huge, sure huge demand in Cymbeline for tiger penis. Okay, I got some. Hey, look who's here! Hey guys." Well, hey, man, Don. The man of the hour. But right. so you are now the new captain of the gin and tonic. They've all been killed by Ursay. Uh, yes. So. <laughs> no, no, actually, we just got back to this thing and they said, Do you want to sell one of your character, your crew members into slavery to pay for this ship repairs? And we said, <laughs> We sold uh, you into slavery. Well, I don't know that I would refer to Melvin as, uh, oh, well, yeah, they were talking about Tam. Tam yeah, I mean, Tam. Would be a good slave. Keeping Melvin, we're saving, we're selling Tam. <laughs> we're selling Tam and keeping Melvin. All you have to do is change your face and come back. You're fine. <laughs> Sell me several times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is on Hulu right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, I've, oh, I've sort of, awesome. I've sort Blondie! of, book, I've sort of bookmarked that to, to watch. <laughs> What a weird movie that is. <laughs> you think about when it was came out, but you're like, this is a non-traditional Western. All right, let's go for the trivia. What's the name on the grave? Oh, man. Oh. I got it right into the tongue. Wow. All right. Anderson. I don't know. Unless you got some Arch Stanton. Arch, not Arch Stanton. Oh, yeah. The unmarked Arch grave next to Arch Stanton's. Right. Arch Stanton. Unbelievable! I can't believe you know that. I'm a, I've I'm seen that. I bet I've seen trivia. "Good, the Bad, the Ugly" twenty times. I can remember that. Yeah. I can also name every line in Aliens, but I won't because apparently you're already married to an alien aficionado. aficionado. <laughs> I I just watched first Monday in October yesterday. Uh, I don't know what that about is, the really Supreme that. Court. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, one of the Supreme Court justices. The one that's new that everybody hates uh, is uh, uh, a, a graduate of the school, the college that my youngest son is going to attend. We're talking about the. Uh, now, the, when you say everyone uh, hates her, you mean Republicans? Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about. No, 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 no. She's hated by the Democrats in this side. She was. She you're was you're one of the uh, the, two, the, 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 two, the sudden two week uh, two week yeah. uh, approval. Uh, you're watch. talking about patient zero who almost wiped out uh, our, our nation's leadership with you know, the coronavirus. <laughs> uh, thing. Like, aren't, aren't you a doctor? Uh, I think it's her name's uh, Amy uh, Doyle or Amy uh, Cornett. Cor yeah, a uh, Cor Corbett or so, whatever her name is. Yeah. Uh, the newest one went to yeah. uh, went to Rhodes College. Not Matt Damon. <laughs> Matt Damon. <laughs> Matt Damon's playing oh, character. Amy of, of, Coney Barrett. Bear, that's it. Amy, yeah, Amy Coney Bear, Bear or whatever. Matt Damon, a uh, very a version of Breath Raff Raffenberger, is that right? Uh, uh, during the Saturday Night Live bit, is one of the best bits of all time. Like, did you drink a lot of beer in the, Your Honor? Oh, Kavanaugh? Yeah, Kavanaugh. <laughs> yeah, Kavanaugh. He goes, <laughs> you mean he was like cool? Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Me and Squee. It's <laughs> <laughs> the best. Uh, all right, so um, so you're gonna uh, you're gonna get uh, a new arm for coffin. Uh, on the you're gonna schedule his his surgery for the day before that you guys plan on leaving the system. The ship will be done. I'm just bringing uh, I'm just bringing Tam up to speed. The ship will yep. be done in about four or five days. They've got some uh, they've got some um, small issues that they're doing. They're not quite done yet. Um, uh, you've had uh, a visit. Uh, well, Wait, Sergei, we're not repairing the ship. We're fixing it with guns, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You didn't okay. hurt my ship while I was gone. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
they did. Good. They did run into. They did run into a problem with uh, the um, AI augmentations. There and, and Sergey is not an AI scientist by any stretch of the imagination. He's like, look, I didn't. You know, I don't know what the problem was, but the technologists had some issues as they were working with Jin on the augmentations to run the guns. Um, uh, there was a representative of, Sp of Spofulum Corporation here in Cymbeline System, uh, a woman named Wen, Wen Yamazaki, who was here, I found out later, to talk to the Terran Legal Authority on your behalf because um, some drone from Sirius named Emix had put a, had tried to put a lean on your ship, uh, 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 and, but she came and took care of that. Okay. Um, and she also brought over a Spofulam technologist that was in system uh, who assisted um, in some of the AI upgrades. Uh, and she also, uh, Cor uh, Spofulam Corporation also contributed uh, an additional 250,000 credits uh, to the overall cost before she departed. But she also mentioned that you guys are supposed to call her uh, at some point <laughs> and bring her up to speed on whatever you're doing for them. Sergey was like, I don't, I don't know what you're doing for her. But, uh, <laughs> she was like, she, she mentioned that you might might call home, phone home, she said. Phone home, okay. <laughs> Uh, and then, so the the the, the TLA guy is uh, Keeve Smitchy, uh, and he's uh, also requesting a small audience uh, with you. Um, you know, he wants to talk uh, to the crew of the gin and tonic, and was uh, poking around. But Sergey also said that there were two um, incidents in which groups or individuals, primarily Ursay tried to either get access or uh, or purchase Melvin. He, uh, Sergey, in response, moved Melvin to a more secure warehouse um, and, uh, you know, has been, you know, you know, keeping it an, on an eye on it, on the warehouse to make sure that nothing untoward happens. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one, there was an attempted break-in by, uh, and they got a picture of him, uh, a human and an Ursae. Uh, you, he, show, he shows you the picture and it's nobody that you recognize from your previous interactions with Ursae. I, I suspect the general. <laughs> <laughs> you would. The general's behind all of this. Um, that bastard. Uh, but also there was an incident where Sergei's organization received an inquiry about the potential for purchasing Melvin up to they are they're off their um their their um latest offer before sergey basically said no i'm not going to do this uh was a mega credit one million credits that well, they were offered for the return let's not of say melvin. no right away then <laughs> well yeah, sergey yeah. basically said look if you want to sell melvin i'll buy him for a mega credit and uh and, and i could probably resell it to this earth safe and i could probably get them above a mega credit i can make profit on this but he's like look I don't, I don't sell my customers' property that they've entrusted to me for, right. s for secure reasons. If I did that, I very soon would not have any customers. So he did not sell it to them, nor did he enter even entertain the offer. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He, do he did offer to buy it off of us so he could then resell it. And I, at least my, I was of the opinion that that's how we got in these adventures in the first place is by not uh, getting into the into the traffic of being a living beings uh, thing, so I wasn't into the... On the other hand, and I just thought of this, and Sergey, uh, well, Sergey wouldn't bring this up, but you might, somebody nefarious on your team, Dr. Wagner perhaps, might say, <laughs> you know, if we sold Melvin to Sergey, Melvin, or Sergey's going to turn around and sell Melvin to the Ursae, right, for a profit. The Ursae are going to take Melvin somewhere else. Yeah, that's a fair thought. You've you've thought. already lowjacked Melvin, and if the lowjack was put on there uh, surreptitiously enough, if it, if it wasn't like a big red thing pinging away like a like a crazy person, you might essentially slip a lowjack onto whatever ship they off they onboard Melvin onto, and you could follow that ship to where they take him, and then steal him back. Well, or murder or that. destroy the ship. I mean, you're going to have guns now. Oh, we have guns now. <laughs> We're not going to have that kind of guns. This isn't a Death Star. <laughs> I forgot that. Well, it's not a fully operational one. <laughs> not a fully operational one. Right. There's not that kind of guns. I mean, you guys are, uh, I mean, you guys will be able to hold your own in a, in a small, 
in a in a small brief space flight. <laughs> yeah, that's all we could afford. <laughs> we really need to get into a starship fight because we're going to use the Starfinder rules. So, <laughs> is, yeah. So, I I think I already uh, said that the the, uh, the spaceship fighting rules in Little Black Book Traveler are terrible, and um, so we're gonna we're gonna use. I, I think you guys will enjoy it. I, I think it it it's it the, the beauty of the star. This is one of the things that I do like about Starfinder. We were talking about Starfinder earlier and how I don't like it, but um, one of the things that I do like about Starfinder is the starship combat rules, which are really elegantly done. Yes. Um, Don at convention, for those of you who are local, Andrew. Um, Andrew. <laughs> when when Don uh, Don runs a starship on Sunday morning at uh, Archcon, uh, yeah, Archon. At Archon. Um, runs a uh, starship battle se session where we spend two hours making ships and then we spend two hours fighting them. And it's always a blast. Starfleet battles? Uh, not Starfleet, not the, no, it's this is Starfinder ship, 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 really ship Starfleet, combat. Oh, okay, just, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's but just in, there's no way you're playing Starfleet battles in two hours. I'm sorry, no, 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 yeah. no way you're playing Starfleet battles in, <laughs> no. in two weeks. But, but one of the I wonderful things Starfleet about Starfleet battles, from one of the wonderful things about Starfinder ship combat is that they've got five different roles, yeah, so Everybody everyone's involved. And if right. you've got more than five people, you can have more than one gunner and stuff, so cool. It's not one guy rolling for the ship. It's each person doing one of three or four things that, that the science officer or the captain or the pilot or the gunner or the engineer do. Um, <sighs> Got it. So, yeah, yeah, it's actually cool. quite good. So we'll use that in, in the event that you guys can do a uh, into a starship combat. <laughs> um, we'll use those rules. <laughs> <laughs> all right so i mean uh uh i don't know uh don you missed missed a lot of the discussion and that's pretty much what this is i'll kind of uh watch the video this time <laughs> yeah this, this entire evening is born but more or less be discussion an entire uh, discussion of of euphemisms when when uh, space euphemisms when russ uses the bathroom <laughs> i have to go to the bathroom so they, i uh my my entry was uh purge the coolant tanks yeah, good. <laughs> we're trying to think of the name of the uh the the, the club that the ursa wields uh, you're pulling out your Ursa club of uh, oh. a, 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 a Maca a Weetle or something like that. Yeah, that sounds like a space penis. We Maca Weetle. <laughs> you're seeing a. Was there was there any ambient music? No. <laughs> Should I get my Kalimba? You, you can add that in post production there, Don. So it's a Maca Weetle, uh, and um, it is pronounced M Mac. Uh, I can't even read Dear that. Lord. I can't even read that. I don't know how you would pronounce something like that. It's well, the, the pronunciation guide is not great, so we're going with Macaweedle. Macaweedle. And you know what it uh, means in the Aztec language? It means stick or wood. So, well, <laughs> well, it works out well done, Aztecs. Yeah. Also, or stick or wood, perfect euphemism for space penis. I was uh, I was sharpening my Mac a Weedle. Um, it just sounds so dirty when you say it like that. All right, but it, so uh, at that point, there's like four or five days left of of uh, installation that still needs to go on. They're fixing the, before the ship's finalized. Sergey offered uh, to take you guys out um, and show you their little private target range if you wanted to test it out before you left the the um, the system. Uh, coffin. Uh, is planning on getting uh, a significant amount of surgery 24 to 48 hours before you guys plan to leave the system, um, which Dr. Wagner is going to walk him through once he's once he's on board ship, get him all calibrated and everything, because there's a fair amount of cybernetic uh, material is going to be implanted in him due to a variety of reasons. And then there's the, uh, then there's Melvin. And then there's Melvin. So what do you guys uh, want to do next? I, you I know, there's so much to the party. I, I, what I was saying, I wanted to, so somebody's trying to take Melvin from us. And uh, what I was saying before you got here, Don, was that I wanted to lay a trap for them while we're here just to make yeah. sure that they don't, either we're either a man trap or a non man trap that we would see if we can uh, maybe capture them before they leave. But uh, what Les said does make a good point. If we did sell him or allow them to take them, then we might be able to, uh, follow them to to the next 
you know, plot hook in the adventure. Interstellar um, Lojack. Yeah. These these yeah. systems work really well. And then we, we, I wanted to go see the uh, the the Terran representative and see what see what they want. I can't imagine it's anything too bad for us. It might be something good or at least information sharing. Also, it might be an idea to talk to Spoff, Spoffulum Corporation about um, uh, the alien before we sell them to anybody. Yeah. Oof, oof, that would, that had also uh, maybe uh, my buddy uh, Wagner there. Maybe Sergey he- didn't say anything. So he, he so uh, Yam- when Yamazaki from, uh, from Spoffulum was here, and she, to, the, to the extent that it felt like she was dealing with whatever emix was trying to pull off, whatever system, but she dealt with that because um, she'd come here. She knew that your ship was here, and uh, she reached out to Sergey and basically was like, and found out that there were some issues with Jin, some problems with loading the 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 programming and the software and, and hardware that controls the weaponry so the AI control of the of the weaponry um, and so she had a technologist in system come and join Sergey's team and they seem to have resolved those issues um, but Sergey did not necessarily connect her with um, with Melvin. So to, to right. Sergey would, so Sergey would tell you, maybe. yeah, Sergey would tell you that it was two different elements, and he had, you know, he didn't have, he didn't know that that um, you know Yamazaki had any idea that Melvin existed, and frankly, he wasn't all too fired up to start telling every Tom, Dick, and Harry that walked in his office about it. So <laughs> yeah, well, at least we we more information. Yep. Hey, hey, Les, mm-hmm. I'm going to make a computing and engineering check just to see if I can find out why they had any sort of trouble. Okay. So, so I'm assuming that you're know. going to talk with the technologists, Sergey's technologists, about what happened, or are you going to talk to Jin? I'm going to talk to Jin. Okay. You're feeling me falling asleep tonight, guys. So if I pass out on the recording, I apologize. That's all right. We'll just watch it and laugh and laugh. <laughs> yeah. So now ten and eleven on computing and engineering. Okay, uh, so what what question? So um, when you get when you get close enough, and you're you have neural ice, when you get close enough to the ship and on the dock, you can see that people are still working on it. They're still doing all kinds of stuff. You're patched in security wise because you are obviously crew. Uh, and when you get close enough, Jin obviously lights up and he's like, "Ah, Mister Tam, uh, it's so good to see you again. I'm glad to I'm glad that you have returned to the gin and tonic. Was your was your voyage to the uh, to the to the uh, two fix system pleasant?" No, but we won't go into that right now. <laughs> All right. It was it was survivable. Let's, let's put it that way. I'm glad to see that you survived, sir. Um, um, I have heard uh, some talk of uh, the installation crew having trouble uh, integrating some of the weapons. Is I, is that true? That there was some uh, installation problems. Uh, um, you know, uh, in large part, when uh, some of that material was done, my uh, my sensorium was ratcheted down to basic level senses. Um, you know, my powers of speech, my powers of connecting to the internet grid, uh, were were taken offline. Um, so I, I do have. Uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a hundred percent aware of aware of exactly where the problems occurred, uh, and I have not been uh, informed of that by the technology team that has done it. What I can tell you is, once I was ratcheted back up to full sensorium, uh, I immediately recognized that I did have the the programming and software modules capable of controlling the weapons the weapon suite on the ship. Uh, I have uh, done a few diagnostic tests of. Uh, uh, tests of my own to make sure that uh, that control is not Im- impacted negatively in any way by the installation and there doesn't seem to be any problems. But um, my, uh, you know, I was, it's like uh, the analogy for a non uh, a non software based creature would be being anesthetized before surgery. Uh, right, my my right. sensorium was ratcheted down several notches. I was I was dimly aware of certain certain elements of my own, um, you know, my own uh, 
what's the word, uh, support mechanisms. I, I had uh, diagnostic control to make sure that all of the, um, all of the support feeds, um, you know, uh, uh, were, were intact and I could monitor those and control those very well so that none of my, none of my um, non, so none, none of my uh, more, none of my biological elements were ever in any danger. I was in complete control of the the feed elements that 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 support those biological elements. Because as you know, AIs are primarily software software and hardware, but they do have a biological element associated. To it. A little bit, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, and, he, and he was saying, "Look, I was in control of those, but as to what they were doing during the installation, I I, I wasn't cranked up that high." Jen, do Bless me you. a favor. Now that you're that you're back, are you fully functional now? I am fully functional. Yes. Okay. Can you do a uh, a side by side comparison of uh, your system core programming from before the upgrade and now, and see if there's anything different in there other than the weapon systems? I can do that. Uh, my my, I know, uh, it's going to take a while for that. It may, it may take uh, 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 several hours. Yeah. Interstitial pop ups. You know. <laughs> I've got to go. I've got to go through malware bites uh, and run a scan. You know that kind of thing. But yeah, no, I would absolutely be able to to uh, do that. Um, like I said, it would take several hours, but I can commence on that right. immediately. My right. um, yeah, my control my control systems are satisfactory to uh, lend what aid is necessary for the uh, for the uh, installation crews. I can certainly do it in a side by side mechanism. Hmm. And I will uh, with your. Uh, if you are so asking me to do, I will commence immediately. Go ahead and commence with that. Um, it is my understanding, and I want to concur with you, uh, Jen, on this, that if there is any sort of uh, um, extra programming um, put in for any reason, we would find that with such a, uh, a diagnostic. Is that correct? That would be my understanding, looking at historical uh, um do you want to, uh, from a historical standpoint, I have various sort of historical imprints that I make as a regular course as backup mechanisms. Right. Um, you you're want me to compare my current versus uh, my historical imprint from immediately before arriving at, um, at uh, Cymbeline? Correct. Okay, I will do so. Okay. And for layman, I'm looking for Trojans, uh, any sort of... Uh, you know, tracking or, or back doors that might have been installed or anything like that. So wait, you need condoms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any adult material that we know. I need to know docked. where they are. <laughs> Any of the adult material is probably docked, right? Yeah. You know. I, I gotta Matt. find out if I gotta find out if they found my porn stash and uh, copied it or anything. Oh yeah. <laughs> By the way, any bear porn they found, I would like to point out. Was, <laughs> I would like to point out that it was Ursa Major, not Ursa Minor porn. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Boo. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna give we go, a high five on Did we go there? Yes, we. Yes, did. we did. <laughs> and it's Man, it's all recorded for posterity. <laughs> Keeping it all legal here, sir. So, uh, Matt, you'll enjoy this, but I, I'm sure I did. I ever tell you about the time we went to New York for the uh, when we got the Trojan vibrator account? For <laughs> so Trojan makes no. vibrators, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, so we absolutely. went to New York, and uh, there was probably 50, four, 40 people in the in the room where we were, you know, with the clients and the, you know, all of the senior guys from uh, from Mindshare and all that kind of stuff. And we had it, and uh, or Maxis, I was at at the time, and so we're all sitting there, and the Trojan people brought samples. <laughs> uh of their products and um our cfo who like many cfos is a sort of buttoned up kind of guy <laughs> um they were they had opened up the box of, of vibrators and they were passing them around uh for people to look at and our cfo got a hold of one that was probably this big <laughs> and so he's fiddling around with it and manages to turn it on and cannot immediately figure out how to turn it off. So the whole room goes quiet, and this thing is going <laughs> in his hand, and he's desperately trying to turn this off because now he knows 40 sets of eyes are on him wrestling with a vibrator. And he finally, it, it, it felt like eternity. <laughs> two to three hours that he had this on but it was probably it was probably on the order of four to five seconds before he figured it out and he finally gets it turned off and it's the whole room is quiet everybody's looking at him and he uh, he he go, he says works pretty good 
And <laughs> at which point the entire room just lays out laughing. Uh, and it was just possibly one of the most comical CFO instances I've ever seen. <laughs> You know, bring the CFOs, the CFO they're known meeting. for their humor. They're known <laughs> for their humor. To, ever bring the CFO to a creative meeting? <laughs> <laughs> it was a hoot. You know, not one of those vibrators made it back to the original box that after that meeting? I don't know what, what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> so I know that at least two people on my team uh, absconded with uh, at least one apiece, and I confronted them later and i said look ladies you're never going to be able to get on a plane with those and they, just, <laughs> and they just looked at me like oh you're so adorably naive yeah. <laughs> all right so um jen is running uh is is running imprint uh imprint analysis should be yep. done in a couple hours um what else do you guys want to do or if or is there anything tam did you said did you want to talk to the technicians or yeah all right. So there's, I mean, they're pretty easy to find and Sergey will, will turn them to it. And basically they're like, yeah, we, uh, we did the work and we, uh, we had some trouble. There was, um, it was, it was weird and it's hard to explain to a layman, but um, when we, when we ratcheted down the AI sensorium, um, we, this is going to sound really weird, but we discovered that there seemed to be a secondary personality existing within the AI matrix. Oh, uh, now that's uncommon, but it does sort of sometimes happen. So we began to do, we, we assumed that there was some sort of uh, subordinate personality underneath Jin that was controlling some element that for whatever reason, your captain wanted to keep separate from Jin's, Jin's control. Uh, there are some, some people that like to keep life support on a separate AI. They're typically just, um, you know, slaved underneath the, uh, underneath the, the primary AI, but there are some people that want a backup system. Uh, so we didn't think anything of it until we tried to take down its sensorium as well. Uh, and we encountered resistance. resistance? Hmm. Uh, which is very strange. We, when, we, when we go in to do these software uh, and programming updates to AI, um, we, uh, I mean, the, one of the first things we do is we take off all, all of the protective systems. Uh, we work with the AI to remove the protective systems so that we have full access to do what we need to do. Um, and 999 times out of 1,000, the AIs are fully compliant, as was Jin. In this case, we got some significant pushback when we tried to reduce the sensorium. So we weren't sure what this secondary AI personality was trying to do. Um, we tried to communicate with it, both uh, common language binary and, um, and hexa hexadecimal, uh, because I don't know how computers would talk to each other other than by colors. Uh, and... Um, we got no response on any of those, on any, any sort of communicate, normal communication channels, no response at all. Uh, there were, we did detect, the one thing that I will tell you is that it was odd, is we did detect, and this, is, this is, was initially, we, we thought, this is, this is what caused us to initially think that the subordinate personality may have something to do with the jump drive, because there was a small amount of jump space radiation that seemed to be coming out of the AI, the secondary personality, but um, it was intermittent. And after we had successfully managed to ratchet down the sensorium of the secondary personality, um, you know, that, that, uh, those, those radiation signals stopped. So, um, we didn't think anything of it, but, um, those semi life forms we came across, was that the same language? Well, it, we don't know if we talked to it, but that's where I'm leaning. We never did. We never did converse with it. Uh, um, we, um, is it frankly, on flash drive now or where is it? Bombarded it with, well, it's still in there as far as we know. When we ratcheted everything back up, we when we ratcheted Jin back up, um, we mentioned to him about, you know, we asked him, uh, you know, what's the deal with the secondary personality? Does it control the jump drive? Is it some sort of computational uh, thing that drives additional things? You and asked Jin. Yeah, we asked Jin about it, and okay. Jin, Jin professed uh, having no knowledge of any secondary construct. And frankly, when we that we were that was curious because that would be impossible under normal considerations. Uh, 
but was what was equally weird was when we went back in to ratchet the secondary personality back up um largely to uh allow Jin to take a look at it um we found that it wasn't there anymore it had somehow either and and so i you know i had my guys go over the diagnostics from the earlier discussion of the secondary personality uh and check the numbers and check them again because my initial thought was that somebody had crossed some data and that they were looking at the data from some other ship that we were working on somebody else's ai uh and they had just somehow connected it with the gin and tonic um your primary AI, I should just say, your, regu your, your regular AI, Jin, seemed to have no knowledge of a, a secondary personality. And frankly, between the two of us, it's probably what it was. My, my, my subordinate technologists, they all claim that there was a secondary personality there. I've seen the data tracks and some of the recordings that they made of, of trying to communicate with it. Honestly, I, I don't know what to think. I think I think we had some uh, some recording data corruption and 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 some things got mixed up. And uh, I have admonished uh, admonished my my people to be more careful. These AIs are sensitive creatures, and they cannot be fucked with without with impunity. Um, but right now, we uh, <laughs> as far as we can tell, there's there's no subordinate thing um, uh, personality in your AI. Right. It seems to be fine. Good, good, glad to hear it. Um, to your question, um, uh, Andrew, it is if you talk to Tam about it later, or if Tam shares with you later, it is sort of the same terminology: um, jump space radiation, odd anomalous field I, generation, things like that. I want to uh, invite the entire crew of the ship out for dinner. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk to the entire crew away from the ship. Make so the sure ship's check, uh, so Doyle's food for him. Jin's effective range at full power using using his full sensor array is pretty far, right? So because you can when you are on the shuttle, you can be as much as an astronomical unit away from the from Jin and Tonic, and he'll use he uses um, you know existing communications traffic and sensory traffic to to you know, communicate with the sh with both the shuttle and with yourselves. Right. That said, while in dock, the bulk of his sensory apparatus are, have have been taken offline. Um, right. You know, you don't need deep space sensors. And we can turn our comms off. Yeah, sure. You can you can create with with neural lace. Well, you don't have to with with um, coffin, but the rest of you who have neural lace, you can essentially create a, a safe room with using neural lace. Right. But I want to do that away from the ship okay well it's a big station so i mean you could go to the other side of right. the, the whole right. side the of the station right. the outback oh, or yeah now uh, i'm not telling the crew there's a I'm blooming onion with my, your name my, on it my fellow crew members here hey let's go somewhere and talk about the ship i'm Get saying some, uh, hey let's go out and celebrate you know a job well done and and the fact that we're getting the weapons that we've always wanted on the ship and just you know have a night out sounds great i'm gonna get uh, some pork wings for the for the table Mmm, <laughs> Porg. Now, while we're out, okay, um, I'm going to explain to them what you know. They've heard that there was some trouble with the with the uh, the installations. Um, yes, yeah, Sergey brought it up, but Sergey's not a technologist by any stretch. Right, uh, but so so I'm going to talk. To, you know, talk to the crew, saying you know I talked to the the engineers that were installing it and everything. Um, and with uh, Jin, I've got Jin running some diagnostics and everything. When they said a secondary uh, personality, I've never known a secondary personality on, on our ship, okay? Um, and just the signature they were talking about, I do think it might have something to do with those alien life forms we have run into with the, the phasing in and out of the jump drives and stuff. I wonder if we might have a stowaway of some sort um, hiding aboard. Um, not sure what we can do about it yet. Um, I plan on doing a little bit of shopping and getting some uh, uh, high-end diagnostic tools. Um, um, basically, less the kind of stuff that Scott would would uh, mm -hmm. 
would use for hacking. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. So I want to I want to get a couple of uh, uh, different uh, software packages um, for that for for uh, for me to do some uh, further digging. Um, I think personally, guys, I think gin is fine. Okay. Um, and hasn't been infected. Uh, but I'm not certain that we don't have a stowaway on board. Um, whether it's well, consciously it's aware of us, consciously, uh, you know, nefarious, you know, fr friend or foe, I have no idea at this point. Well, it resisted effort. So, so there's some well, interesting things to unpack there, right? So this was this thing was the second the secondary subpersonality was discovered uh, while they were working on the AI, right? So right. when you talk about a stowaway, that stowaway may not be physical in the street right, right, of the right, word. Right, right, right. It it may be all in the computer systems. This, you know, yeah. Well, I can see the look on Coffin's face as security <laughs> chief when you talk about a, a some sort of sub sub stowaway in a shadow AI inside the subsystems. Because when you guys are out in space, Jin controls pretty much everything about the ship. I mean, he takes orders from from Tam and Black. Right, but right. But there's so much going on that yeah, Jin has to run everything. It controls life support. It controls the doors. <laughs> um, you know, it controls. Uh, you know. Um, you know how the jump can you know i mean it does the jump calculations you tell you tell it where you want to go but it's gin that does a lot of the calculations um the the high level you know math that controls yeah, things i mean right. yeah exactly you know it's like are you okay Dave? i can't you know when gin starts I going can't do that now <laughs> yeah I, I really you know open the open the cargo bay doors gin <laughs> i can't do that captain black <laughs> what? but i mean you know tam says i talked to gin he seems fine and the guys that you talked to, the technologist was like, look, we didn't detect it after we came back. And you got the impression from that guy that he really kind of thinks that it was a mistake on his guy's part, that they yeah. somehow crossed yeah. some things. And, you know, the and guys are perfectly the guys, willing to let them think that. <laughs> yeah, the guys, I mean, the guys swear up and down and they've got, you know, they've got communication ribbons and, and stuff like that. They're like, look, look, this is the data we got. You know, all of that is recorded and all of it's that kind of stuff. And he's like, look, that doesn't happen. You don't have a you don't have a sub personality controlling something in an AI one day. And then when you boot back up the primary, it's gone. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's not a thing. Hmm. Hmm. Man. Um, okay. Les, mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot longer. Okay. But when I get back to the ship, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a, uh, a core dump of uh, Jen's, uh, you know, systems, complete systems from... Uh, before we started this whole thing <laughs> from the start of the adventure pretty much yeah from the start okay. of the adventure um to uh to current okay okay so you're basically you're going to ask jen to examine uh no no all i'm not asking jen i'm going to download it i'm going to examine it it's going to take days oh, okay yeah. but i don't want jen involved in case this stowaway would also know about it. So you can have Jin uninvolved, especially if you essentially what you're doing is you're taking the memory templates uh, of current and old, right? Off uh, off boarding them from Jin himself into some other non Jin containment system. Right. And then running a comparison without Jin's help. You can right. do that without Jin's help. And you're right. It'll take a couple of days at least. But right. you can't do it without Jin's knowledge. Jin would know that I'm taking sure. both recordings. Right. Yes. Not necessarily what I intend to do with them. But yes, Jin would be aware of me taking both recordings. Right. Um, 
Unless we ratchet him down again. I, I, I think point. I need him up a I little mean, bit just to get the recordings off him. Uh, well, I mean, you might not be able to get him, but maybe some of Sergey's guys do that are used to. I mean, they're they're AI specialists. You're a you're a navigator and computer specialist. Right, right. I've got some skills, but not I'm not specialized in it. Right. Yeah. Um, you should make Don watch all of the recordings of the trailer campaign so far to get a bonus on his roll. <laughs> Well, let me do. Let me do this. Yeah, <laughs> and like them on YouTube. <laughs> um, fifty-seven clicks. Yes. You don't have who's the Who's the savviest programmer hacker that Sergey has, or well, or like, knows that he could hire? Don't you know a guy? Well, he's he's got he's got people. Um, it, they don't they don't work for free. No, I know. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if you did, so there's a difference between, you know, r- normal technology hacker and AI hacker. An AI hacker, right, right. AI, AI hackers are expensive. Yeah. But they exist, and Sergey could probably find you one. Hmm. Hmm. Now, guys, I don't mind continuing our you know our activities while this guy does reviews right. um again i don't know if the if there if there is a stowaway do we have no reason to, to to know what his intentions are to us yet or even if he's even aware we don't even know if he's aware of us let alone you know if he's a friend or foe to us or anything like that i mean it's well, going to be a completely well, he, foreign type of life form. He can't be too much foe because if you do have a stowaway, it would have have to have been proxemic, right? And so let's, you've, you've encountered these creatures on a number of occasions, but the, the latest time that you encountered one of these, these odd jump space radiation emitting creatures would have been on the dead Ursa ship which was well over a month ago and you've made several jumps since and then. we've made several jumps since then and everything right right could be a sleeper agent could could be a sleeper agent one thing i want to be careful of is if we do discover him how our next steps really need to be non-threatening uh-huh. you know well, if they can ration him down they can certainly isolate him and Put him in a jar with um, our other Melvin. Don't know yet. Well, I mean, it's, but the other thing is it's, you're, you're not sure if this is a physical creature. Right. No, but AIs can be contained and isolated and transported, sure. right? Sure. Put him so on a flash drive. Put him on a flash some drive. Physicality Put him on a flash it. drive. Absolutely. Delete him from, from the gym and everything. Yeah, but. Sell him, uh, sell him on the street corner. <laughs> AI, get your AI here. Control your ship. Run your life support. AI, here you go. Completely foreign on AI. We don't understand it. <laughs> it's like a AI. hot dog vendor at the ball yeah. game. Five dollars off lemon sandwich house, <laughs> and you're free. AI. But you know, no, I, I, Dr. Wagner's right. I mean, um, you can download the the contents of an AI into a secure vessel. Those secure vessels can be quite large but essentially the analogy is apt you can right. put them in you can put them in cryo or a bottle of bourbon uh well it's too big for that but, but um you probably need something about the size of a car a small car um like melvin's tank but first we need to like find tank. out if he exists okay so i just wanted to let you guys know uh my thought p- process uh what with your permission captain that's what i'd like to do is uh hire someone that would uh investigate this better um maybe even you know he may be even advise us how to how to make contact with it great all right let's get started first coffin needs an arm and now gin needs a psychiatrist <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to space, gentlemen. <laughs> okay, so we can go back to the ship now. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So if you guys actually go go to the ship, uh, Jin seems. I mean, he's back. He's obviously not asleep. He, you know, as you get into field uh, way, and you you feel like his his effective range right now for talking to you, and he's talking to you over lace basically. But it's about a hundred meters, maybe less, maybe eighty meters from the from the physical ship itself. You get there, there are still people working on it. They're doing stuff. You guys are all patched in there. This is a secure area, um, but you guys are all pre patched. You know, as as crew of the ship, you can get you could actually go on the ship if you wanted to. Although there are certain portions of the ship that are open to vacuum right now, um, so maybe going on the ship without a vac suit is not a great idea. But uh, because repairs are, you know, the, the stuff is still going on. But um, but you can certainly talk to Jin hmm. if that's what you want to do. See. I want to go see the uh, representative, but we can do that the next adventure too. The Terran, yeah, the TLA guy, yeah, yeah. Terran legal authority. Yep. Yeah. Now, do you want to go on your own so you get extra? Food I think I think we don't have to bring everybody, but you you want to come with me, or, or do you want you want some plausible deniability or whatever lies? I was going to say understand. not for plausible deniability, but for other reasons, I'm probably the absolute worst person to be. There. Okay, then I'm happy to do it. Um, maybe uh, have, we, have we sold the uh, the whiskey bottles we had? We we, we at least not. put the we put the word out to that we're looking to sell one okay. case. <laughs> I was just I was going to my. Uh, my funds so I could pay for, you know, a good dinner for all of us while we talked about that and everything. It was my idea. So I was going to pay for it. And I noticed that I had, uh, you know, 200 whiskey bottles of a thousand yeah, credits we're, each. We're and checking with our buddy here, if he thinks he can move some of them. Okay. Yeah. Just let with, me know. With Sergey or? Yeah, Sergey. Yeah. Oh, Sergey. Yeah, can... that last... I missed that. Sergey can yeah. absolutely move them. I asked you guys if you mentioned it to him and, and yeah, yeah, Matt, Matt was like, no, no, no. Said, but one case. Yeah, we said one case. Oh, one pallet. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. He can move. He's like, yeah, I can move it. He goes, I, I, he goes, my uncle sends me, occasionally sends me a couple of cases um, the, for me to move. And I, I make a pretty penny. If you've got 10 cases, a pallet of this stuff, he's like, yeah, I can move it. He's like, in fact, I will, I, he goes, I've got buyers that are willing to pay premium for it. So I'm willing to go to, to 1200 a bottle uh for the lot so 120 kilo credits for the pallet so we're already making money on it all right well wow. all right i think uh is it possible he wants to do even better if we trade it for for work on the ship or is it a he, yeah he says he'll take you straight up if you want if you guys want to apply to the ship i can i can take another 120 off or if you want it um in, in credits uh, spendable credits. We could just keep. Yeah, we can keep those two deals separately. Most of us have tiger or bear penis. Yeah, I think most of us have cashy money. Forty, in our right 40 now. credits a piece, but they have to be frozen. Yeah, <laughs> that's where we got distracted last time. Last time. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it, it, it's up to you guys. He's like, look, I, I, the offer's the offer. If you got, if you want it in 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 hard credit, or if you want it in, uh, you know, against your bill. We could do either. The, the price stays. But it doesn't change the price any. Mm -mm, no. Okay. I take it as hard credits then. Okay. So who's our accountant? Is that me? Well, yeah. No, I'll I'll have to alter the ship's ledger. Yeah, we tr we trust the NPC uh, AI. <laughs> I have I have the ship's ledger, so I'll I'll be able to put that in there. Uh, Don, okay. Don is the one. Don, Don is the uh, the the author of uh, Who's Got the Gem and. What's your sleep schedule? And what's your sleep schedule? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I, I know it's a completely different adventure, but it still it resonates in my DNA. So uh, I got my final vote. So just so you guys know, I got the final votes on that tonight. I'm going out tonight with the with the finals. Uh, nice. The two the two quotes that are going to be in the finals. Who's got the gem? And what is your sleep schedule? That's a Don. <laughs> and everyone is fast when they're falling off a roof, which I believe <laughs> is a Chuck. Both of those are classics. Uh, I'd have to look. You know, I'll, I'll find out. But here's here's what the next thing you do. I think you need every one of those quotes. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't exist in the world anywhere. It's time to cafe presso's up. Uh, so <laughs> I know, start a whole t a whole t-shirt quote line that 
Everyone is faster than falling off of when they're falling off a roof. Chuck. <laughs> they just put a little late night game night logo or something out there. Yeah, exactly. Come up with a good logo for it. I'd wear that shirt. Marlo would be like, you paid five whole dollars for that? <laughs> <laughs> Only the best at Cafe Press. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, do you want to go down to TLA, Mr. Mr. Jinx? Yeah, if we have time, I'm, I want to do it. Okay. Uh, like I said, I, I spent a little time replacing my uh, my my duds to look a little fancy. Get a little fancy. All right, get your cape uh-huh. back, that kind of stuff. All right, so yeah, you go down there. So TLA is obviously, this, this they have a, a big sort of uh, um, set of corporate offices on Cymbeline Station. Um, they also have offices on the on the planet side, um, right. although the the station office is bigger. There's a fit when you go in there, you kind of like bust in there, and you're like, uh, um, you know, there's a fair amount of activity. Uh, a lot of it is related. Your guess is is related to the war effort, the war between uh, sure, sure. Uh, Kagok and and Cymbeline. Terra is keeping an eye on things and trying to control the spread. Again, it doesn't. They don't. They've They've already failed diplomatically to keep these people from from getting into a shooting war, but um, they're definitely succeeding in keeping it from getting anywhere else. The last thing they want is for space wars yeah. to get outside of the. My mentality is, as I recall, almost all of us, if not all of us, are ex-military of the Terran forces. Largely, so, yeah. So, so um, we're we're, uh, we're all patriots, but we're also cynical uh, burnouts and <laughs> don't want to deal with bureaucracy unless we have to. But I also right. want to get her out of the way. Right. I mean, you know, so. <laughs> So yes, a lot of you, most of you, are veterans of the the Salamini military in various capacities. All of you are citizens of the Salamini cluster, uh, with rights and privileges and responsibilities thereon. Um, some of you may have local citizenship as well, like you know, um, by virtue of being, if you guys ever become like full employees of the Spafulam Corporation, you get Mirabilis a system citizenship which has certain right. certain benefits as well so um you know there are varieties of, of citizenship but yeah the terran legal authority is generally speaking largely deals with uh non-local problems right so local problems are often handled you know if you got if you if you fire off a gun in green Perth station you deal with green green Perth constabulary right you're, you're yeah. dealing with somebody named bill if you blow up a Kazinti ship at, in Green Pert system, that's more of an international incident, and that's where TLA would step in, right? So they no they're like they're, they're they're fed they're the feds. Yeah. No one can prove that was us, Les. <laughs> so if you go down there and you ask for the guy, I need to I need to I'm, I'm itchy to speak to Smitchy, Keeve yeah, Smitchy. Uh, uh, so yeah, it takes a few minutes, uh, but they fetch him out and they're like, uh, so he seems to be, you know, your average sort of bureaucrat type, a little overweight, a little, a little huffy, uh, you know, red in the face, tinge of sweat behind, you know, on the jowls. And he's like, uh, yeah, what can I do? My name, I'm Smitchy. What can I do for you? Smitchy, I'm a representative from, uh, the, the noble ship uh, gin and tonic and uh, I got a little message you'd like to have a little chat with us and I thought the, gin, the gin and tonic the gin and tonic I, I remember that I remember that ship hold on a second let me let me, let me, let me hold on uh, uh, let me call up this thing he pulls out his data pad and he's like gin and tonic bullshit okay oh right 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 the gin and tonic you guys uh he's, he's obviously reading and looking at you. he's like you guys caused some problems in green part uh, we've got it. We've got a uh, oh. diplomatic issue from the from the Ursa government. Uh, something about uh, 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 some uh, some property stolen and a aren't, few deaths. Aren't they at war at war with the Ursa? No, Terra's not at war with the Ursa. The yeah, Ursa aren't at war with anybody. Got it. Okay. The uh, Kazinti uh, and the affront. The Kazinti are, and the affront. I, I'm aware of what happened in Greenpeace Station. It was a tragedy. Yes, I believe there were some criminals. That prov- that uh, you know assaulted some crew members and were dealt with swiftly, but mm-hmm. in terms of uh, you know uh, why uh, an, a government would be interested in these criminals and their nefarious activities is of uh, interest, I think, to the Terran constabulary. 
Hold that thought. We should record this. I'm probably going to need to take a real statement. Come, uh, just sit over there for a second. He points to the, and he, you see him okay. walk over and he's talking to some uh, Vargas I'll, secretary. I'm going to make sure my uh, my body pistol is somewhere nearby just in case. He's like, we need to we need to use the statement room. And she's like, it's fine. Uh, and so he's like, come with me. Your uh, your name is Jix, right? That's me. All right. Ex, um, ex naval officer, sir. You know, we're all patriots uh, here. Yeah, it's all here. It's all here. Yeah, we get it. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, you basically go into a small, uh, probably three meter by three meter room, sit down, and uh, you can tell that it is festooned with various <laughs> sensors and cameras and recording equipment. And, all about uh, the table, right? All over the place. Uh, and he's like, um, uh, AI, start recording. Interview with Weber Jix by Keeve Smitchy, TLA, um, regarding incident in Greenpurt dated, you know, X, XYZ. Um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jix, can you uh, explain in your own words what occurred, what transpired on these days in question uh, at, at Greenpurt? Well, before we do that, can you confirm that you were on Greenpurt along with the rest of the crew, including, and he lists off uh, a number of names, including the general. Um, you were at Greenpurt Station on such and such a time period, universal standard time? Well, I'm a bit of a drinker, sir, so I can't say everybody you mentioned is on that list, but I know the general for sure was there. You definitely want to want to finger him if you need anything. <laughs> Um, but, and of course he is a high ranking person, so he's very easy to determine. Yeah. But aside from that, um, yes, I believe I was there. We were doing, uh, you know, our usual typical, uh, cargo runs, transporting goods and services, uh, across the realm, you know, I see. And, uh, can you describe to me, uh, the incident that occurred and which is the core of the Ursae complaint against you and the, and the rest of the crew of the gin and tonic? In your own which, words, please. Which, uh, which, which part? I believe there was... He kind of looks at you minute. sideways. He's like, stop recording. <laughs> How many parts are there? <laughs> are there multiple incidents that you'd like to discuss? Oh, let's start with the original one, and we'll just leave it at that. Start recording. Describe the incident. In, in, the, uh, in the transfer of cargo, we realized um, the person we, that we were transferring uh, passengers of cargo had passed away in his stateroom. We noted this in the ship's log, which we found and recorded at the time. And uh, when we went to look at the cargo he'd asked us to transport, we realized it was a not only a living person, but a person of, uh, you know, of note, or at least of scientific note, that had been cryogenically frozen, potentially against his will. So we wanted to uncover this nefarious scheme before we turned it over to the Green Pert Station uh, people which we did you can ask uh i believe bill scaramouche can certainly uh, add some detail to this uh we're, we're good with all the bills over there you know the bills right they're they're good people the bills <laughs> um and the stacy's and uh so when we uh we realized uh what was going on we, when we confronted the uh the buyers maybe they didn't understand that this was uh what this nefarious thing was and they opened fire on us and we were forced to defend ourselves. This is on a, this is very strange too, because as you know, Greenprint has a very strict laws about weaponry on that station. We were forced to, to uh, defend ourselves and then disarm the, some of the combatants, including an Ursa. And in the course of this, uh, this, this melee, a few of their people might have been injured or killed. But after that, uh, you know, I believe. The Ursa had a little chip on her shoulder, and they kept trying to heckle us wherever we went. You know, just doing our, our legal business about uh, on and about the Greenford Station area. You do realize that the Ursa complaint contains a variety of details that seemingly are in direct opposition to your to your statement here. And they mentioned the uh, what I mentioned the the was a kidnapped scientist that they apparently the government of the Ursa potentially, if you're interested, was paying for kidnapped Terran scientists is that was that what maybe their their statement doesn't you, reflect? See, you see his eyes kind of like a as he's you can tell that he's like referring to you know he's he's querying something in his lace he's like there is no uh there is no mention of any kidnapped scientists or scientists in general in any portion of the ursa uh, document that was submitted to tla i i believe you know i believe this one particular time might have been a spasilam uh, corporation person we mm -hmm. did contact them about you know we did release this, you know, rescue this person, release them 
to the recognizance of their former employer or their you know, their current employer, and I believe they were quite grateful to us. So, you know, we might be able to verify that with the Spafilam uh, HR, perhaps. We uh, we will indeed. Uh, Was there anything else we want to clear clear up here? Well, basically, he uh, says, uh, uh, just one minute. Um, he basically says he keeps you there for a couple hours and records that he's like, you know, goes into more details. It's a pretty significant interrogation and you get feel a little wrung out, but you stick to the story. And basically, he's like, we'll get back to you. And uh, um, but uh, um, night, Dan. Please be, no, please stay in, there. please stay in touch. Oh. And uh, uh, we, I, w- I will want to interview the rest of the crew as well. So please alert them to that fact that before they leave Cymbeline, I would like to have a discussion with them and explain, sure. explain their legal obligations under the Terran, uh, the Terran consortium. Just exactly what is the legal obligations, especially when it was, I was, you know, as far as I, you know, there's obviously multiple points of view in this particular situation, but as I can see it, the, the uh, if, if the Ursayer, um, bringing this complaint to you that means it seems that they were condoning this criminal behavior uh that that, that we you know, heroically uncovered and uh, brought to the, uh, the attention of proper authorities both will, locally at Greenpoint and of Terran. I will discuss this with my counterpart in the uh, uh in the Ursay uh the Ursay mission here uh in Cymbeline and uh we'll get back to you how long will you be on station it's hard to say. We're just making a couple of repairs here and there, but you know, I think we can avail of ourselves. I'm not sure everybody has the time to make a two plus hour interview with you, but everybody's, you know, not everybody's want to be as loquacious as myself. Uh, that's certainly true. All right, we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll check this out. We'll be in touch. Yeah, let me know if you want to do something a little informal on the ship too. We could you know, put out a couple of drinks. We've got a a nice vintage of booze that you might enjoy. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we just wrap this up real quick. Uh, you see him, uh, he's like, end recording. <laughs> I might yeah. take you up on that. I, I might take you up on that. It's not Tufik Bourbon, is it? Because it's hard to get. It's, it's Tufik. Yeah, we were just there, man. We just picked some up. So, oh, sweet. You know, maybe, uh, to, like, literally, her, while the recording's off, is there anything we need to be worried about here? Like, I think it was all on the up and up. Let me look into it. It sounds like, it sounds like the Ursae are talking out of their asses, out of their big yeah. fuzzy asses. And I'm no yeah. fan of the Ursae. Let me, uh, let me, I'm let me reach saying, out uh, to my counterpart and see if there's any merit to this. If it's as you say it, I'll talk to Greenport and I'll also are talk we, to Spopulum. We, and if we have to, if we, we can, we can see about making this go away i know we need to wrap it up here but are we just let me let me remind myself with captain black and stuff but are we on legally on the books for spoffy land corporation or are we on like are we off the books you are off yeah. the books okay so i don't want to bring them in except for the fact that we returned our scientists so yeah we don't get yeah, and that's all too much that's all you brought up so it should be yeah it should be i didn't um, i didn't finger him i just fingered hr I, if HR is a pain in the ass now in 2022, Raising. what it isn't. What about space HR is? Uh, yeah, how painful that bureaucracy is. <laughs> uh, figuring in HR is never easy. <laughs> Gentlemen. Yeah. All right, Good Eric. Thank All you, right. bud. Good night, Eric. Uh, I'll send you. I'll send you some materials about your new arm, so we can get you up and running, uh, uh, clanking away first thing when we come back. But otherwise, chainsaw arm, Eric. Uh, chainsaw arm. Stay strong. Look look forward to uh, look forward to playing again soon. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. You guys take care. All right, night all. Take care. That was fun, Les. Thanks. Thank you.